I think the Fed is very optimistic that they're going to see lower levels of inflation, but they're not forecasting 2% inflation anytime soon. We think it's going to get back into the 2 to 3% range on core inflation by the end of this year. I think we need to at least get to 4%, and that's the problem. It's difficult to do that without precipitating a full-blown recession. I do think inflation has peaked, and I think that's going to give the Fed the ability to not tighten the U.S. economy into a recession. Inflation has not peaked. I, I mean, peaked on the core level, but as far as energy and food, inflation has not peaked. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg <coughs> Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive, four tenths of 1% on the S&P. TK, there's a storm coming. Oh, there's a storm coming. Jamie Dimon lighting it up. And really, Lisa, I thought some of that was off of Christian Malik in our interview that we did in London. John, it's real simple. J.P. Morgan does a lot of fancy work, a lot of math, a lot of algebra, and they're looking for higher oil prices. Maybe that's part of the hurricane. And his chief equity strategist is still very bullish, Tom. Marko Kalanovic came out and said this, despite <clears throat> the steep sell-off, we believe that markets will Loving recover year-to-date losses and result in a broadly unchanged year. That's a heavy lift for the back half of 2022. It, it is, and it's wonderful to see that division at any major bank, and it's a healthy division, always part of the debate. Michael Darda coming to Kalanovic's uh, rescue today, and Darda just saying the recession gloom flat out is wrong. He's adamant, John, off those economic data, the ones you like so much, the ISM data, that, that you know what? Uh, it's not that bad. It came through pretty decently yesterday. Job openings came in just a little bit, but still elevated. The quit rate's still there, pretty high. Lisa, let's talk about crude. We're down more than 2% on WTI, on Brent as well. We've got a report from the FT. We might get more output from Riyadh. And a report here at Bloomberg that the president might be making a trip to Saudi very shortly. We've been hearing about this. He's going to be going on a NATO tour later this month, and it might include a stop in Saudi Arabia to encourage the increase in production. The report in the FT talking about how Saudi Arabia may actually consider increasing production in response to a decline in output from Russia. How much does this matter, right? How much does this matter to diesel, to refined goods? And I think that this is actually one of the key issues. How do you translate that into lower prices at the pump ahead of the midterms? Well, the key issue, the struggle, you've touched on it there. How do you reconcile your foreign policy goals with your domestic troubles? And right now, a foreign policy objective was almost to isolate they never really talked about it openly, but almost to isolate the crown prince in Saudi. You remember that first news conference with Jen Psaki? That came up. They talked about it in the early days of this administration. And she came out and said that Secretary Blinken would be speaking to his counterpart, the crown prince, not the president of the United States. A little bit later, you come fast forward into 2022. Lisa, where are we? Crude's high, gas prices are up, and all of a sudden, bit of a change. Right. So have we gone out of the frying pan and into the fire, right? Do we isolate one uh, and, and the, on the other hand end up trying to buddy up with another regime that has questionable tactics and, and human rights uh, uh, violations? There is an issue here of what do you do in the near term to stave off the pain? And that seems to be the calculus in Washington, D.C. and frankly, also in Berlin. I mean, this is not isolated to the United States. We have got a lot to get through this morning. Good morning to you. Bit of data out later this morning. Let's start with a price action. Equity futures on the S&P uh -huh. positive by four tenths of one percent. Where's the Nasdaq, Tom? Nasdaq's up. Where's the Dow? Up. There you go. That was just for you. Enough Thank now. You. Yield time by basis point on a ten year to two ninety one sixty eight. And there's crude. Lisa WTI one twelve seventy six. I am not going to ask why. Lisa, pick it up. I'll just say down because let's go there. 8.30 a.m. We do get some more of a read on the crude market. OPEC Plus is planning to meet via video conference. Will it last more than 13 minutes? That is my key question. Also, how does it bleed into the price of gas? Gas prices in the United States, the average across the nation, have climbed to new record highs day after day, nearly $4.70. How quickly can a reduction in crude prices translate into a reduction in the cost of refined goods, considering the blockades that we have seen in just actually getting that crude translated into gasoline. At 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims. Notice I did not say the ADP report, which we're getting out at 8.15, because I never know what to do with it. Honestly, it's always Correct. very noisy. 8.30, the job openings I am more interested in as a follow-on to the job openings uh, data that we got yesterday. It did come in a little bit, but still nearly two job openings per each unemployed American. We are not seeing uh, the volume of people getting hired increase all that much. Again, 
hard to translate this data, but it really does indicate that this is an incredibly, incredibly tight labor market and it is not loosening materially. At 11.15 a.m., President Biden is meeting with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, as well as the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Ahead of that NATO meeting uh, later this month, I really do want to hear what they have to say, particularly about Saudi Arabia, John, because truly that will be the most interesting part of this leg uh, of this trip, considering the fact that it is a bit of an about face from Washington, D.C., in their attitude towards Riyadh. Lisa, thank you. Looking forward to the coverage through this morning. TK, I'll give you 30 seconds. You can have 30 seconds. You can I've show us your wave. I've been practicing my waves all I know you have. This is the Duchess of Cambridge wave. The clock starts now. Go I on. And this is the, the late the Queen brief. Mother's wave as well. I mean, John, explain this to our, no, no, our no, global no, no, audience. No, 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 no chance. I'm not playing royal correspondent for the next two <clears> days. You wanted to do this. You explain. Oh, no, I can't. I, you can't. Before, before, before the show started, you know what Tom said as we see these pictures? That's where they did the volleyball, the beach volleyball in back 2012. in 2012. You balcony shot. shot. For those of you on radio, it is a balcony shot with all the pomp and circumstance that we're looking for the various and sundry royals. Some invited John Harry Kane, rumored to be on the balcony. Is that right? Yes. Is that the extent of your insight on the Thank you. over in London? Who's saving morning? me? Vanessa Friedman. Let me have a tang here for Vanessa Friedman of the New York Times, who's been on the show many times on fashion. She's saving me this morning, I'm John. I'm sure you've had more than one tang Chris Ferrone's going, let's go, let's yeah, go. Let's get to Chris right now. Chris Ferrone. <laughs> the head of technical and macro strategy at Strategus, a bad company. Chris, not really talked about this morning, but a German 10 years making a new high for the year. And yeah. I wonder for the people making the conclusion, coming to the conclusion that we've seen a high of inflation, a peak in yields, can we say that when we're seeing this develop in Europe right now? John, I think it's a great point. And, you know, when we travel around and talk with clients, I think the most consensus view on the street is that we've reached the moment of peak inflation or peak yields. The only problem with that is the market is not justifying it. It's not just German 10-year yields at new highs. Look at Aussie 10-year yields this morning. Look at UK yields. Look at French yields, Spanish yields, Italian yields. Across the board, the global bond markets have not bought into this, uh, have not bought in to this idea of peak inflation or peak yield. So listen, peak inflation is a math problem, right? There's base effects. Uh, that'll sort itself out over time. But the reaction function of the market is what we care about. Right. And the reaction function of the market isn't buying the story. Chris Ferron, what is the reaction function to the opening of China? Well, I think you're seeing it uh, in a couple places. Number one, I think you'll get another bid in the commodity complex here. I'm not sure that's great for Europe. It's a little bit of a catch-22 here, right? We want inflation to come down, but we have... China easing, right? We have a first decile PMI reading in China, which is going to incite more easing. We've seen the Chinese uh, yuan start to weaken here. So I wonder if this actually reignites some of the inflation fears. And, you know, that's what strikes us here, right? You have CPI running in the low eights. I can't think of anyone who thinks it's going to be higher a year from now. Everyone's in the camp that it's going to be lower. I don't think the bond market's buying that story. So what does that mean in terms of the bullish side or the bearish side yeah. ahead? Well, I think it means when we look at the leadership uh, of this market, right, we've seen triple Qs, the top of the market, the growth part of the market, underperform going into this drawdown. It's underperformed during this drawdown. I suspect what it means, Lisa, is it will continue <clears throat> to underperform on the other side of this. I think these rallies in growth stocks or in tech are opportunities every time they bounce to get smaller in that part of the market. The market has told us this is not your leadership anymore, and that's a message that we want to respect. Chris, just briefly on energy. I think we all hear the same voices yeah. over the last few months. We see the gains year to date. They're huge. I get some guests coming on just saying, not over-owned, not over-owned. And I sit there thinking, well, we've had a massive move this year, big move last year. Yeah. How are we still talking about a segment that's absolutely ripped roared through the last two years that's under-owned? Chris, is that real? Is that an under-owned industry group still in this equity market? So, John, the language we've used is energy is overbought but not overowned. And by overbought, listen, it's 40% above the 200-day moving average. That's the most extreme reading we've seen in 40 years. It could certainly consolidate or correct from that. But it's 5% of the S&P. 
right? So to say it's some massive weight that it's over its skis from a structural weighting perspective in the S&P, I think is a bridge too far. And, you know, when you think about the culture of the market over the last decade, with the proliferation of stuff like ESG, we have pushed investors away from energy. So I don't know how it can be overowned here. We did some work this week looking at the largest ESG fund in the world. Its correlation with the S&P is 0.99. Right. So when you think about indexed <laughs> returns, that's that's ESG versus something like energy, 5% of the S&P, I still think very under owned. Hey, Chris, fascinating to hear from you, as always, buddy. Chris Verone there, a strategist. That industry group, Tom, at 58.4% year to date. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a play here, and we're going to see. You wonder about rotation. No one's talking about rotation, John, but I, I'm just going to suggest, as you mentioned, with the J.P. Morgan battle between their strategist and their chief executive officer, this is the raging reset in the mid-year. I'm suggesting mid-year starting 30 days in advance, June 1, and here we are. And yesterday, I'm sorry, that data wasn't the gloom cruise view. I agree, Tom. You look at the ISM in America, Lisa, if you looked at, say, the job openings in America, the quits rate in America, the data is still pretty decent. Is this good or bad? I'm sorry. I know that people are going to accuse me of being the absolute from the market gloom, perspective. But from a market well, perspective, market is itself, that good or bad? Right. And honestly, what you're seeing is the Jim Bullard school of thought getting more and more dominance. This idea that perhaps they could go up to three and a half percent for a Fed funds rate with the goal of dropping rates lower by 2023 uh, later in the year or 2024. How much is this becoming the base case as the economy is not slowing down because it yeah. will force the Fed to be more aggressive? Good or bad for who, what? where i'll tell you where and what the two-year <clears throat> as you talked about what happened off the back of that data yesterday tom treasury's down yields up yep. yields up at the front end more work to do with the fed oh we're 306 in the 30-year bond you wonder when we get the 10-year back to a three right now 2.92 percent john you know 500 people used to park their cars on the house guards is that right field it was the great perk until 1997. We need great perks on, on Bloomberg surveillance. Future's up, Tom. Do you want to wave us out? Yeah, I'll wave us out. You wave us out. I'm going to do a Duchess Cambridge out. On radio, this is emotional. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The price of oil fell after a report that Saudi Arabia is prepared to pump more crude, according to the Financial Times. The Saudis have indicated to Western allies that they are ready to increase production should Russian output decline substantially. The OPEC Plus coalition is meeting today and is expected to ratify a modest increase in production. Meanwhile, President Biden is likely to visit Saudi Arabia this month as soaring gasoline prices hurt him politically. The trip would mean the president would almost inevitably meet with the country's effective ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. President B Biden has blamed him for the 2018 murder of a U.S.-based Saudi journalist. And Charles Sandberg helped turn Facebook from a startup into a multi-billion dollar advertising powerhouse. Now she's calling it quits. Sandberg is stepping down as chief operating officer of Facebook parent Meta Platforms. After 14 years, she served as the highest profile face of the company next to CEO Mark Zuckerberg. But she was criticized for the company's failure to rein in large-scale misinformation and privacy breaches. Russia says it is ready to settle claims on bonds that were judged to have breached their terms after missing a $1.9 million interest payment. It's an attempt to avert an insurance payout potentially worth billions of dollars. The Credit Derivatives Determinations Committee said a failure to pay event occurred on credit default swaps. Russia blames foreign counterparties for the delay. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, police say a gunman killed four people at a medical building, the latest in a series of mass shootings in the U.S. Authorities say the gunman apparently killed himself. It's unclear what led to the attack. Police say they were on the scene about three minutes after getting a report. Global News 24 hours a day. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This week, May jobs are in focus. There are 11 million open jobs. And you wonder how that folds into the future of the American labor economy. Friday, Tom, John, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. The labor market is starting to get a little easier. 95% of the jobs that were pre-pandemic have recovered. Because there's more resiliency in the economy. The May Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
It's a hurricane. It's we, right now. It's kind of sunny. Things are doing fine. You know, everyone thinks the, the Fed can handle this. That hurricane is right out there down the road coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or Superstorm Sandy. Jamie Dimon making some headlines in the last 24 hours, the J.P. Morgan Chase chairman and CEO. Wow. TK, what did you make of that yesterday? I think magnitude is the issue here. In economics, one of the great divides, John, is sophomore year. They start talking magnitude, and they look at it on a log basis. He gives you the magnitude of the hurricane, but one of the issues here for Chairman Powell is you don't have a hurricane, and you ebb away. And what you get, John, then, is a longer-term inflation. If you don't get the cathartic recession, we get the longer-term inflation, which crushes the middle class. In many ways, Tom, wasn't he just stating the obvious? There's some storm clouds brewing, there's some yes. trouble on the horizon. Yeah, well, yeah but yes. Might be a weak hurricane. I mean, might be a strong one. I, I, I give great credit to Lisa for driving Brian Moynihan and Davos toward actually talking about the banking business. I mean, I'm sorry, John, a lot of these CEOs now want to go all macro all the time. Yeah. And I just wish you'd read Kasman and Feroli, who are not calling for a hurricane. Elisa, I think that was a subtle dig there from TK. I will say, <laughs> if you take the more complete quote from Jamie <clears throat> Dimon, he does end up by concluding about the bank and what he's doing at the bank because of the challenges that they face and maybe just lightening up some, some risk with the balance sheet because of what we could face right. further down the road. Although, let's be honest, Jamie Dimon usually when he gives these speeches comes off more, and this is something we were talking about earlier, as a statesman or trying to be sure. a figurehead rather than a leader of a bank? And does this yeah. sort of indicate where mm. his role is going to evolve or where it should evolve oh. in terms of the eyes of people who would like to see some uh, sort of predecessors uh, come up and try to right. get through the ranks? we got to do this quickly before Jack Fitzpatrick on Washington politics. Lisa talks about figurehead. John, let's go to the Jubilee no in chance. London. And in the front row, separate from the royals, is the prime minister. They showed Prime Minister Johnson earlier. Is he on the edge of Theresa May, John? Is you, he really threatened? You're, you're going to do your utmost to make me the royal correspondent you over are. the next 48 hours. But, I am not playing. OK, but the prime minister, is his job really threatened? That's up to him, Tom, about whether he wants to resign or not. Would people like to see him step down? Some people would, yes, after the party gate right. scandal. Others still support him. <laughs> is, That's the balance view. Is this how Tom's <laughs> trying to get you to play into the Jubilee? Is I, I to ask about Johnson's is going. future? I don't know where this is going. <laughs> nice Are you trying try. to transition from there to the Queen's future? I'm going to transition. Like, where, where do you want to take this? I'm taking it to Jack Fitzpatrick, who's going to save us in <laughs> Washington, uh, capital of the colonies, uh, right now. Jeff Fitzpatrick, the president I know, is riveted to the Jubilee as well. But there is no Jubilee at the White House. Let's go to what we need to talk about on Thursday. Does he need to shake up the White House to get the the Sunday talk shows. Uh, you know, the, there's been, I, I guess, murmurs about when there might be a White House staff shakeup uh, for a while now, because you see the White House kind of re responding frantically to a series of crises and uh, the pressure he's faced and, and really kind of the lack of answers from the White House on why the president didn't know more when the FDA should have told him more uh, about uh, the baby formula shortage. It, all of that seems to uh, lead to those questions, but I, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure at what point the pressure builds enough so that somebody's got to go. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, at this point into the presidency, it's it's kind of been dominated by uh, responses rather than uh, sort of fulfilling his vision. It's been responding to crises, uh, but it, you know, he hasn't expressed frustration well, outright with anybody in particular. Jack, you've been covering uh, the politics in the Beltway for a long long time. How unusual is this feeling that this president, his administration is constantly behind the eight ball, whether it's with infant formula, whether it's with gas prices, whether it's with inflation, whether it's with uh, just the, how things are developing on the labor front. How much do you get the sense that this is a uniquely behind White House versus run of the mill, classic, hard to gauge, a very fast moving economic cycle? Um, I think it's not that unusual for the news cycle surrounding the president to be responding to crises, uh, especially in the environment we have in Washington right now, where a even a fairly minor crisis could be ginned up into something bigger as you get close to the midterms. But it is uh, the the set of circumstances right now are pretty extreme. So, um, obviously, there's not a lot of history 
history to go by for how you respond to uh, opening up during a pandemic. It's a very difficult set of circumstances, but also it's, it's not unheard of for uh, the presidential news cycle in recent history to be dominated by uh, pretty negative news and struggling sure. to respond well, okay. to a crisis. Jack, there uh, is this issue now of whether or not the president's going to head to Riyadh, whether the president's going to head to Saudi Arabia to try to have some sort of communication and a better relationship uh, to induce more oil production from that region. How is that playing in Washington? Um, it, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how much pushback there are going to be from Democrats if there is really an easing of the relations between President Biden and Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, obviously, there, there's uh, some uh, leftover angst over the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, and there are a, a number, a certain number of people who, who supported the president's initial view that he would only uh, directly communicate with the king rather than and the crown prince. It's not an issue that lawmakers are bringing up over and over again. It's it, it's a bit sad to say, but about four years having passed, uh, it's it's not something where the political pressure has uh, continued so much that you could, it, it, I guess, expect an immediate massive amount of pushback toward that. There may be skepticism, uh, but we're not hearing a bunch of preemptive pushback from allies of the president right now. Hey, Jack, great to catch up. Jack Fitzpatrick there down in D.C. <coughs> crude lover this morning by 2.5% on WTI 112. T.K. Brent crude, 113. Yeah, 113 off of it, and we'll see where that goes. John, I'm going to bring it over to FX. I don't think we've talked enough about resilient dollar here with yen buttressed up against a 130 week yen over week euro pretty much the last uh, number of days. It's beneath the radar, but I'm watching the deepest market to see some of the, the, some of the, the tones here as we go to that jobs report. And looking ahead, beyond the jobs report to next week in the ECB, um, Bramo looking at yields in Germany, new highs for the year. This you, morning, new highs for the year. Yeah, and if you take a look at what people are gaming out, they're now seeing the likelihood of a 50 basis point rate hike, possibly as soon as September in Europe, right? This was off the table. This was an unheard of uh, reality. And all of a sudden you have even members of the ECB considering this. And this comes in the heels of what we saw from Canada yesterday. And yes, I know who cares about the Bank of Canada? I do. It was actually hey, I never, really I never interesting. Said a word. I well, never I know, said but a word. it was actually I like the Canadians. I know the Canadians. How can you not like the Canadians? I love the Canadians. They're wonderful. But honestly, they also set the tone often yeah, but they for central need banks. Defense. I mean, they need defense and the power play just isn't there. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Hey, TK, do you want to wave us out? We'll do this yeah, every, every, every here segment. Here we go. Wave us okay, out. The balcony. The balcony scene's coming up here. It's coming up. Okay, and then the Duchess of Cambridge is sort of this kind of thing. You're not missing anything. How am I doing, John? No real drama here this morning. Good morning to you all. Futures just about positive on the S&P and the Nasdaq, up a third of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1%. Marko Kalanovic over at JP Morgan thinks we can recover the year-to-date losses. On the S&P, that's about 17 18% away. It's quite a rally you can expect into year-end if you believe that is the case. JP Morgan and the team thinks we can oh. avoid a recession. And, Tom, one ingredient for that rally, stimulus out of China. Marco yes, Kalanovic yes, very yes. focused on that particular factor to push us back up. We mentioned that with Christopher and Johnny. 100% agree. I'm not sure, you know, I'm no expert on it, but I think we're way down playing China at reopening. John, let's do the drawdown right now as part of your data check here, folks. It's not that gloomy out there. The Dow down 10%, SPX midway. But, John, look at the damage in the NASDAQ. I like how you led with the Dow and then you want me to take you seriously. Yeah, the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ's been brutal. It's off the lows, though, Tom. Big move last week. Yeah. What we saw in the month of May to close out May, Marco and the team thinks that's a template. They think that's a template for the rest of the year. We'll see. That's the call from them. And yeah. I got a lot of messages yesterday about whether Marco and Jamie should have I got... a chat. A conversation. Oh, now come on, it's healthy. To work things It's down. healthy. No, I don't agree. Hey, it's healthy. Tom, it's not my view. Just again, so, just present the views of many about people. The That's what we do here. Would We're not we going to talk coverage about that. Of the Jubilee? We will talk about the bond market. In Germany this morning, yields making new highs for the year through 120 on a 10 year back to 290. And all of a sudden, we're thinking about 3% again yeah. after topping out at 320 at the start of May. On a two-year yield, 265, yield tied by about a basis point. A lot of this coming about off the back of decent right. data in America and the idea being that this Federal Reserve, Tom, has more work to do. 
John, I agree totally. Folks, I want to make clear with the Jubilee and with these guys with the, the hats on. We're having the royal tang this morning, John. I think you've drunk it's, enough tang it's already. Like a little, it's a, thing of, it's a little in. shot of beef feeders here with the tang. Left you. Enjoy yourself. I'm going to get to crew. WTI and Brent. Please. And I'll just finish up on this. Two reports this morning. One from the FT, the Financial Times reporting that the Saudis could be getting ready to pump more crude. That plays into the story we heard from yes. the Wall Street Journal earlier this week. The second story came from the team here at Bloomberg that maybe this president is thinking about a little bit of a visit to Riyadh later this month, Tom. That's teeing us up, yeah. but perhaps a loosening of this commodity market. Brent and WTI lower by about two and a half percent. Helena Croft writing this morning with RBC. She's looking for a great bargain as a possibility between Mr. Biden and the royal family in Saudi Arabia. Sarah House joins us now on the American economy and yes, the seriousness of the jobs report tomorrow. Senior economist at Wells Fargo. Sarah, I want to talk about fully employed America. Which America is fully employed? Well, I think when you look at what part of America is, is fully employed, I mean, the, the job demand that we're seeing, it, it is broad based. And so we're seeing it across various sectors. So whether it's the professional services, but also in terms of some of those um, lower paying service sectors where we've seen hours tick up. And overall, when we look at the, the U6 unemployment rate, so that is broader and includes some of that some of those part-time for economic reasons, we've seen right. that near record lows as well. So I think by and large, no matter how you slice it, well, uh, I think you are seeing a, a very tight labor market right now. I'm being told by people, Sarah, not Wells Fargo, that the chairman of the Federal Reserve wants the unemployment rate to go up. Who in America should lose their job so the unemployment rate goes up? Well, that's why it's so politically sensitive and, and why... The, the Fed officials will never come outright and say it, but I think implicitly they do need the, the labor market to cool, and that's probably going to involve the unemployment rate ticking up just to relieve some of the inflationary pressures that's stemming from the labor market. So if you look at the unit labor cost trends, we'll get an update on that this morning, but they're trending at roughly 5%. And so that implies either steep compression in margins or still significant inflation coming from the labor market. Fed can't do much about semiconductors. They can't unload ships out, out the port of L.A., but they can impact that that labor that labor portion of, of inflation. Sarah, which aspect of the labor report that we get tomorrow is going to be most important to the Fed? So I think a lot of it is going to be focused on participation. You know, the headline always matters in terms of how many jobs we're adding, what the pace is relative to what we've seen previously. But I think so much of the job outlook and, again, how tight this labor market is and how much tighter it could get comes down to what we see on the supply front. So we saw a step back in participation last month. I think that's probably more, more noise than signal. And we expect participation to trend higher as some of the constraints that have been holding back Workers. So things like health concerns, maybe some of the child care constraints continue to ease and some of the financial needs among households grow. But I think we are seeing in, in some ways, like if you look at the prime participation rate, it's already recovered quite a bit. So there's still some questions about how much further that can go and really how much slack there is still left on, on the sidelines to help alleviate some of that, the current tightness that we're seeing. Taking a step back, Sarah, last week people were talking about a potential pause in Fed rate hikes come perhaps September. This week people are rethinking that and all of a sudden the data is showing ongoing momentum and frankly uh, inflation continuing uh, to be not only sustained but increasing, particularly in the services sector. How do you view the Fed's actions in response to this and the likelihood of a Fed pause at some point later this year? So I think the likelihood of a Fed pause this year is, is very low. If you just step back and look at what we're seeing out of the primary mandates, inflation, the labor market, both of those are still red hot. And I think we've seen officials at least agree on the fact that they aren't going to really be able to to ease off the brakes until they see inflation slow in a definitive matter. I don't think we're going to see that until very late this year. So I think we're going to see headline CPI stuck essentially around 8%, probably through October, which means the Fed won't even see that till November. So I think the talk of, of the Fed pausing is, is premature at this point. Sarah, this idea of seeing inflation come down in a definitive matter, manner, what does that mean? What is the number? behind that? Have they told us that? Do we understand the threshold? 
They haven't told us, and I think you know it's it's in part going to be driven by by composition. So I think it's going to matter what's happening with the core. So if it's elevated from the point of of energy and food, which I think will be a big source of that, then then I think if they're seeing that core decelerate, they they might feel better about a, a slowdown. But I don't think it's it's any one particular number that they have to see. But I think it's it's slowing more on more on a trend, and you know at least nowhere near the eight percent rate that that. We're going to be stuck at here. Tom, this is the problem here. This stuff is pretty vague. And these calls about a Fed <clears> pause, <throat> what's behind them right now? And are they being endorsed by Federal Reserve officials? I think it was Rafael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed president, last week that made the point that maybe we could have a pause. I... He was keen to point out this week with Market Watch in an interview, Tom, that yeah. that wasn't about a Fed put. <clears throat> he had very little interest in that whatsoever. Yeah, and it's all data dependency. I mean, they're going to make this. John, you you know, you, you do the calendar out of inflation reports. I'm sorry. That's the major thing here. And then I'd overlay the jobs report as part of the dual mandate of the Fed. They're massively, massively, massively data dependent. And the reset in Jackson Hole. And Sarah, I'd love to go there with you. We're doing our planning for the rest of the year. We were talking about Jackson Hole yesterday and thinking that's somewhere we need to be. Do you think that could be a big moment for this Fed? So I think, I mean, Jackson Hole always has a, a lot of attention. I think given how quickly things are, are moving in, in both the markets, the economy and Fed policy, I think it could be an, a forum for another big indication of, of where the Fed goes. But I think when we look at where we'll be in August, we're still be dealing with the same problems that, that we have today. So the fact that we are still seeing this elevated degree of inflation, I think we'll still be looking at an overly tight labor market. And so I'm not sure how much of a shift in, in Fed tone we'll see. But again, things have been moving quickly and a lot could change. And I think um, there's, there is likely to be a, a lot of focus and, you know, uh, at least some guidance on, on where the Fed could go. But I don't think the circumstances will be all that different from where we Sarah are Sarah House of Wells Fargo. Sarah, thank you. Setting us up <clears throat> later this year for the year ahead, Bramo, this Federal Reserve, in the words of Sarah House, is not set up for a pause anytime soon. And frankly, a lot of people agree with her, and yet you're not necessarily seeing that in the market. There has been this pause that people have experienced as far as, far as like a, a sigh of relief, and how much can we actually get to uh, the aggression that the Fed is saying that they are going to have, and frankly, that the data is confirming. What did Bill Dante say on this program yesterday, the former New York Fed president, Tom, on that Fed pause? He said, I would not put too much stock on it. The market is priced to a peak in the federal funds rate of 3%. The Fed will probably actually have to push beyond that. Ultimately, the former New York Fed president, yeah. Tom, still very well, hawkish. Well, some serious clout there with the Berkeley math and, of course, decades at Goldman Sachs as well. We, one of the big differences, John, with Bill Dudley is he actually has gone through the pressure of forecasting. There's a certain humility to what he does rather than selected presidents tossing out you know, media-friendly statements. Would you like to tell us who those selective presidents are? No, I wouldn't like to do that. John, I just had a... I, I just, you know, we go to Jackson Hole. We're working on it right now. We'll see if it happens. But, John, you and a pair of Tony Lamas, I can just... You know, I don't think, John, you want to go... Can the you Tony, translate? Tony Lama, two tones, but you want to go with the Leviathan uh, boots. They got the sort of the ostrich kind of, like, what is South that, American man? lizard What's thing going. About, They're God. sort of a Brazilian kind of Tony Lama. Okay. Do you want to explain a little bit more about why I need what these he's, are? Because you got to wear the Western garb your, out there. He's coming up you with know. your wardrobe. He's doing our wardrobe. We're going to do a, you do a full English in London, John, at the Pioneer Grill at Jackson what Hall. What do they serve? You do a full Teton. Okay. A sea of mushers, Bramo called it. <laughs> Different <yesterday>, mushers. <laughs> which I'm never, <laughs> I'm never going to forget, Tom. Okay. That's the reason why do I'm not talking about the Jubilee. Do you want to take it back on this Jubilee celebration? <clears throat> I like yeah, well, I think... Stefan Toast. I don't want to take that back. It was really good. We, I mean, it's we... gotten to, like, a lot of precedent. Yeah. People talk about, you know, avocado toast here in the U.S. I'm just saying. Okay. John, can we talk about a business transaction, sure. which is maybe the future of sports? I get a AC feeling where Milan, this is going, yeah. AC Milan taken out by Redbird with some bolt-ons. This is a company that doesn't buy a majority. They're really good at going in and buying a hunk or a bit. This is Jerry Cardinal. They've got some Fenway linkage as well. But I really wonder if this is the future of sport. 1.2 billion. And Tom, I think shout out as well to Elliott Management. Who would have yeah. thought that that hedge fund would end up owning a football club? And they did it in a very well, strange set of circumstances and really helped turn around that team too. Tom, here's a tweet for you. Most annoying anchors of Bloomberg, Tom Keane. Pharaoh, best examples of how to talk over one another with useless banter. There we more go. More than any useful business news. We do it just for you. 
It's just for you. And we're going to do a little bit we more do, for you do. in the next segment. Yes, futures the segment up after 20. That. The segment after that. S&P and the one futures after that. up 20. What's the hate about, Tom? Just, where's well, the no. love? You you, know? well, you got to do a show, John, and at any given time, 42% of the people have to hate you. You've, Thank you. You've got to upset someone. From New yeah. York, this is Bloomberg. Lisa, we upset Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The price of oil is falling today following a pair of reports. According to the Financial Times, Saudi Arabia has indicated it's ready to pump more crude should Russian output decline substantially due to increasing sanctions. Meanwhile, President Biden is likely to visit Saudi Arabia this month. That could lead to an increase in Saudi oil production. Soaring gas prices are hurting the president politically. Banks in China are facing growing pressure to support cash-strapped property developers. Regulators have been pleading for months, but that hasn't boosted lending to the industry. Builders and regulators are counting on banks to provide a lifeline as bond funding and home sales dry up. In Virginia, a jury sided with actor Johnny Depp in his libel lawsuit against ex-wife Amber Heard. Jurors awarded him $10 million and vindicated his allegations that Heard lied about Depp abusing her. But the jury also found that Heard was defamed by one of Depp's lawyers and awarded her $2 million. The crypto business run by billionaire brothers Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss is making its first ever job cuts. Gemini Trust is slashing 10% of its staff as trading across the industry plunges. In a memo seen by Bloomberg News, the brothers blamed the job cuts on what they called crypto winter. Last year, Gemini said that it raised $400 million in a round of funding that valued the company at $7.1 billion. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. As we get tangible evidence that inflation is definitely retreating, then uh, we could look at reducing the policy rate in future years, 2020, maybe late 2023 or 2024. Jim Ballard, the St. Louis Fed president, can we just sit on that for a moment? The idea that we could be looking at reducing the policy rate in 2023. Tom, Come on. that's next year. <laughs> Look, look, Deutsche Bank goes out with a recession called a late 2023, and I'll give them some slack on that, and that that's their job is to look out like that. We've got Fed presidents doing the parlor game out a year and a half, John. At least I can say that's original. Well, Tom, it's original to talk about bringing down inflation, <clears throat> get rates up to 3%, maybe more, and perhaps do that by the end of this year and then talk about cutting interest rates next year. Should that even be part of the conversation? Exactly. There's it's, always two-way risk I, around a policy story. I get that, but I just... Don't see the Look, value of making that comment right we had now. To, we had to move beyond Arthur Burns' smoke rings and the very narrow communication strategy of Alan Greenstein. But, John, to me, it's out of control. Futures right I, now, I just, Tom. I just... Up six tenths of one percent. That's your move. It's out of control. We're both out of control. Let's go to London right now. Professor Norm is going to join us here in a minute. But on radio, you need some pageantry. They're trooping back and forth on the beach volleyball court of 2012. The horse guards, uh, 240 horses involved. There's a good shot of the sand. Nailed that, Amy. Absolutely nailed that shot. There we are as they move through the morning. 14 of the lads are from Coventry, all growing up with John Farrow. Right now, Julie Norman joins us from UCL. We're going to do a little explanation here. Professor Norman of the University College London, how does a jubilee fit in to the total political chaos I read every day of the United Kingdom? Well, Tom, I will say there's a definitely a sense of respite this weekend, a break from the political slog that really has been plaguing uh, the obviously the conservatives, but both major parties. And alongside with that, you know, we've heard a lot about U.S. inflation, but inflation in the U.K. is up around 9 percent as well, is not coupled by growth. So people, especially outside of London, have really been feeling the economic strife, the political strife. And also just coming out of two years of lockdown and COVID. So I think this weekend people are ready well, to celebrate and get back to business le uh, next week. John from Milan emails in and says, get off the Jubilee stuff. So, Julie, let me segue here <laughs> over to what you just said, which is the city focus of our modern time. Everything's about London prosperity. Everybody else flat on their back. Everything's about Paris prosperity. Everybody's flat on their back. I mean, that's the modern political economics, isn't it? The strength of the city. 
Well, it certainly is to a certain extent, Tom, and I've definitely seen that here in the UK. I mean, the the current growth reports here show that six out of the eight areas of England are actually having negative growth. London, obviously, there's some marginal move, move, movement forward. But in most of the country, reality is much different than it is here in the capital. I think that's something that's underappreciated by a lot of the political parties and as well as uh, even many of us in academia. So we see that here. We see it in the U.S. and in many other parts of the world where I work as well. Julie, talk to me about the political lessons in the U.K. when it just comes to policy. Sometimes I look at the policies coming out of the Conservative Party and the lines are blurred between left and right, the windfall tax. I remember, of course, the early 80s is something a Conservative Chancellor has done before. But the opposition accusing the Conservatives of borrowing their own policies. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, it's interesting following the policy here, John, because, as you noted, there's a bit more crossover than there would be in the U.S. Even many conservative policies uh, to many Americans would look a bit more liberal or even progressive at times. Obviously, it's not always perceived that way here, but it's a situation here where I just think, you know, you have a very uh, weak opposition. Labor has not really been able to reorient uh, themselves around any kind of strong leadership. And so it's uh, kind of create a system where, you have two relatively weak, relatively moderate parties uh, in power and, uh, and not a lot of progress. And obviously there's more calls for Boris Johnson to step aside from within his own party than from anywhere else. So we see a lot of internal wrangling a little bit more than we do in the United States, where there's much more of that, uh, that two party, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of back and forth uh, between and not as much within. Julie, how much has the UK really set the tone when it comes to that windfall tax? How much do we expect to see something similar in the US? Uh, well, it's a good question. I mean, there's been a lot of different relief efforts that have been put in place in the UK, even under the Conservative government since the start of COVID, that we would not have seen the equivalent in the United States. And that's just partly because of the system and partly because of the expectations here. So even though some of the policies here, I think, work, I think they'd be a lot more um, risky and also just have some questions right. about feasibility in the United States as well. And now we go to our surveillance journalism. John Farrow, with great respect, should the Queen pay a windfall tax on her oh, here we substantial go. assets? What are you suggesting that should look like, Tom? I don't know. I just wonder. I mean, I mean, I think it's been underplayed for decades and decades, the accumulation of wealth over the years, not overtly by the Queen, but just the fact that they own half of the ground that you, you trot. I mean, what portion of Heathrow do they own? And the answer is, should they be paying a windfall tax in trying times for the United Kingdom? Professor Norman, please. <laughs> Uh, well, John, I, or, uh, Tom, um, I'm not sure about that one. I think uh, I think the Queen is just going to be enjoying her weekend this weekend. But um, but yeah, in terms of the taxing kind of system, I just there's things that I think they can push here and that people in the UK expect, and it's something that in the US would just probably not fly to the same level. Julie, very diplomatic. Nice. Thank you. Excellent. That was actually yeah. wonderful. That wow. was a great punt. Julie Treasure. Norman of the UCL Centre on US politics. Mm. Thank you. Tom, I went through the polls this morning over at YouGov. This is questioning all Britons. Should we continue to have a monarchy? 61% said yes. But if you go by age group, yeah. listen to this breakdown by age group. Please, please. 65 plus, 81. 50 to 64, 70. 25 to 49, 53. If you go to 18 to 24-year-olds, that age group, as low as 31%. Yeah. That's what the future looks like, Tom, I mean, for the monarchy I, at the moment. I, I'm, f I'm fascinated from it, but Lisa, at the heart of the matter is we are the colonies. We are from a distance. Yes, correct. That's why <laughs> I'm not going to weigh that, in. Lisa. <laughs> Boy, John, well, I mean, honestly, where I, am I supposed did, to go with that? I, more, I don't know anything get, about the Jubilee. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to try to tweak John Al, with fake knowledge. Al, I'm not going to do that. Can I get more beef eaters in the mm -hmm. tank, okay. please? I and Tom's going to keep trying. We've got another day of this, Bramo. Oh, no. I thought I was getting a day off. I didn't. I thought I had tomorrow off too. You know, I did not put it in my brief. I just want to put that on the record on purpose. I thought about it and then I was like, you know what? It's going to be a distraction all day anyway. It's a distraction, all right. Futures look like this on the S&P. Up six tenths of one percent. If you're just tuning in, equities higher on the if Nasdaq. Up eight tenths of one percent. <laughs> what have you missed, Tom? If you're just tuning Sterling in, Sterling is one twenty-five. I got to go back and calculate what it was like. I do when want to talk about crude. One twelve handle on WTI. One nineteen ninety-eight. The highs of the week hey, John. on WTI. Two reports out today. One report suggesting from here at Bloomberg that the president could visit right. Riyadh later this month. Another report from the FT suggesting we could get some higher oil output out of Saudi Arabia, yeah. just weighing on the crude market this morning, Tom. John, this is important. This is what surveillance is about, folks. In 17 minutes, Christian Malik will join us, not to go after his boss, but to frame out 
how commodities and particularly hydrocarbons play into the stress you hear in James Diamond's voice. You have to ask him if a hurricane is coming. So oh, yeah. That has to be the lead question. I mean, to for be anyone fair. from JP Morgan this morning. This that is, has to be the lead question. This is the if you're a client, you're asking that, aren't you, Tom? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I, 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 I would also Christian want to know if, cancel? where Christian's going to celebrate the Jubilee. You can ask him in a moment. <laughs> Futures up six tenths on the S&P and the Nasdaq up eight tenths of one percent. Another nice morning again, say, Bramo. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Let's see if they last. <laughs> from New York City, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> I think the Fed is very optimistic that they're going to see lower levels of inflation, but they're not forecasting 2% inflation anytime soon. We think it's going to get back into the 2 to 3% range on core inflation by the end of this year. I think we need to at least get to 4%, and that's the problem. It's difficult to do that without precipitating a full-blown recession. I do think inflation has peaked, and I think that's going to give the Fed the ability to not tighten the U.S. economy into a recession. Inflation has not peaked. I, I mean, peaked on the core level. But as far as energy and food, inflation has not peaked. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up a half of 1% on the S&P. More data still to come this morning stateside. And Tom, the data so far, so good. So far, so good. And it's going to be interesting on claims and on jobs data tomorrow, John. And maybe you get a reaffirmation of recession. Well, maybe not. Michael Darda leading the way with an, a terse note this morning that the Gloom crew is flat out wrong. The Fed is fighting the last war. You saw the reaction in the market, Tom. Yields higher, treasuries lower. The conclusion, the Fed has more work and to do. And dollar resilient as well, which is, you know, rates come up, money flows to the dollar. Have we broken through? No. Is there any drama in the data check this morning? No. But the fact is we've had a real reversal of the gloom. Speaking of reversals, there is some drama in the commodity market. It's somewhere it's there in WTI and Brent. We came so close, Lisa, to 120 on WTI this week at 119.98 and then a big turnaround and another one yesterday. With Saudi Arabia possibly increasing production according to a number of reports, including from the Financial Times in response to a decline in output from Russia. First of all, how do you gauge the decline in output from Russia given the fact that a lot of their oil is floating on ships to China right now, right? So that's number one. But number two, uh, at what point is this willingness, a tit for tat with the U.S. government? How much does this depend on President Biden heading over to Riyadh to make peace with the leader of Saudi Arabia? And how much does some of these oil calls depend on China buying more crude yeah. from Russia? J.P. Morgan, we'll catch up with them in about 10 minutes, came out with this line. China needs to increase its purchases of Russian crude by a million barrels a day. If that doesn't happen without China, Brent crude could average 122 in the second quarter, peaking at a monthly average of 136 in June. That's painful. How much visibility do we have? I mean, we talk <clears> about all of these corporate executives coming out with just this uh, question of we have no idea what's going on. How much visibility do we have when people are tracking with GPS systems, the tankers heading to China from Russia because they're trying to move under the radar? I mean, just to give you a sense of the uncertainty in the direction of oil prices. Well, that's the issue you have in a C-suite right now. So Jamie Dimon yesterday making this point, Tom, I think it's where the emphasis lies that's important now as a corporate leader. What do you do if you think the storm clouds on the <clears> And you prepare for those kind of things, Tom. Yeah. You brace. That well, was his point. The, the corporations are going to adapt. That's all there is to it. Again, Christian Mela coming up here in 13 uh, minutes. John, I would really make a point here of the commodity move that you mentioned. Bloomberg Commodity Index, which frankly is better math, did not go out to a new high yesterday. But Doug Cass down in Florida notes CRB, which is the old school. You'd figure from Cass, a Yankees fan, he quotes CRB. That does break out to a new high. Equity's breaking out just a little bit. Not really this morning. Up a half of 1% we'll on the S&P. Nice. A width through it for you on the Nasdaq 100, up six tenths of one percent. Lisa keeps calling these nice moves, no. just nice, nice. moves. It's a nice no. move. Just no. nice no. moves. No, you it's were the nice. one who called it that, and Lisa, then you're going to put that very on. Very frustrated, Lisa. It's, it's, well, I did not nice call just, it that. Just let me get to the bond market. Carry it's carry meant to be a, a, a day of celebration for the Queen. <laughs> 290.76. You on that. Yields <laughs> unchanged, Lisa. At 291. So a day of celebration. We're not going to let that go, John. 8:30 a.m. OPEC Plus is meeting via video conference. 
How long do they actually meet for? That's my big question. Also, uh, is there more of an indication from Saudi Arabia that they're planning to increase production to offset a decline uh, from Russia? How does this trickle out into gas prices, right? There's been this disconnect between crude and the refined goods. And in the U.S., you are seeing gas prices continue to climb to record highs. How much further does it have to go and how much can uh, lower crude prices in the near term really change that dynamic all that much? At 8.30 a.m., U.S. initial jobless claims. How much does this follow on to this feeling of tightness that we got yesterday with that JOLTS data, with that job openings data? Two job openings nearly per each unemployed American. Where are the workers? When are they going to come back? What's the participation rate looking like? And are we starting to see a number of businesses say, you know what, we don't even need the workers. We're just going to cut those positions. And perhaps even some of the people who we've hired, whether it's Amazon or Walmart, were overstaffed for the moment that we're in. And you start to see that tick up in the jobless claims uh, that we get at 8.30. And at 11.15 a.m., President Biden is meeting with NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, also joining the meeting is a Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, talking about that June meeting, uh, the NATO summit in Madrid. Again, I want to hear about President Biden heading to Riyadh. How problematic is this from a political perspective, given uh, the fact that there's been a huge rift between these two nations and there's been a feeling that the U.S. shouldn't get too cozy uh, with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? How much does that actually end up being a sticking point or is, is there some sort of support uh, more globally from NATO? At least you'd have to think, believe that he's just drowning overwhelmingly in domestic issues. And that gas price every morning, we talk about it with Anne-Marie every single morning. That's a major problem for him. It's a major problem for him, and it's also a major problem for all NATO nations. So do they band together and try to uh, somehow bring Saudi Arabia back into the cause, back into the fold, because of that necessity? Ramo, thank you. Big week ahead. Payroll's coming up tomorrow. Kathy Jones joins us now, Chief Fixed Income Strategist at the Schwab Center for Financial Research. Kathy, 120 on a German 10-year this morning. For all this talk of peak inflation, peak yields here stateside, on the other side of the Atlantic, can you make that call yet? Yeah, I don't think we're quite there, uh, just because Europe has been lagging the U.S. in terms of this cycle. Uh, but I don't think they're far behind either. Uh, you know, we're starting to see that catch up. We're starting to see the market build in the expectation for a tighter policy in Europe. So I, I think they're lagging us, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Kathy, the, the yields that we see are, are, are a complete mystery out the third quarter. How, what does your top end look like? How far up do you frame yields could go to? So when we're looking at the short end, you know, we're still looking at the Fed tightening uh, 50 basis points the next two meetings and probably then switching to about a quarter point increases in the fall. Uh, and we see them topping out, you know, probably in that two and three quarters area. Uh, we're, we're a little bit under sort of the consensus and what's built into the market. When we look out to the 10 year, our, our expectation is the upper end is that three to three and a quarter area. You know, as you wow. get into a tightening cycle, yields converge um, across the curve. We're already seeing a little bit of inversion from fives to tens. So we think three to three and a quarter is the upper end of what we're going to see. Kathy, we're talking this morning about the two-sided argument within each of these houses at banks and beyond of whether we're too gloomy or whether we're too optimistic. And the data is coming out strong. Does this mean that the Fed has to go much harder? That basically, yes, you could take that three and three and a quarter percent 10-year yield, but the path to get there is one paved by a Fed that essentially has to end this cycle, has to create a downturn. Yeah, it, it certainly is the way that, um, you know, they're talking right now and have to take them seriously. It's pretty much across the board from daily to Bullard. You're hearing the need for tighter policy. And I think that um, this this cycle reminds me of the early 80s. Um, you know, Tom might remember this. But, uh, you know, you had high inflation, relatively healthy economy. And the idea was just to, you know, really get that inflation down. And uh, Volcker at the time came in and just jacked up rates until we tipped into a recession. We had two back-to-back -back very sharp recessions. So that's kind of the risk, I think, if the Fed goes really hard here. But that certainly sounds like the intention that they have. And Kathy, how achievable are these forecasts over at the Federal Reserve? Unemployment at 3.5% this year, 3.5% next year, 3.6% the year after that. How achievable is that? I'd say that's aspirational. Um, <laughs> it would be... <laughs> 
surprising to me if you could have the kind of monetary policy we're getting with higher rates and uh, QT along with a global tightening cycle and still keep unemployment near three and a half percent. Do you think they should rename the summary of economic projections Federal Reserve aspirations? <laughs> I think so. You know, they're never going to forecast failure, right? So, um, so true. They, they, have to, they, they have to forecast, you know, what they hope happens. Kathy, thank you. Kathy Jones at the Swab Centre for Financial Research. TK, the aspirations of the Federal Reserve. Oh, there's not much to talk about here, John. They're going to go. Their aspiration is to wait and wait and wait. Every central bank does this. It's Alan Meltzer 101. They are data dependent. What's interesting, John, as we heard from Mickey Levy yesterday, and this goes to James Bullard, who we heard earlier, is even if there's a whisper of targeting, that forces them to move higher. You like that line, Lisa? They'll never forecast <clears throat> failure. Yeah. Plenty of people are doing that for them. Well, yeah, and they have a, they have got a credibility issue if they don't acknowledge that and indicate that that is a high likelihood. And that was what we're hearing a little bit more from Fed Chair Jay Powell. But that is a conundrum. They can't forecast failure. But if failure is a slowdown in the economy, isn't that kind of the goal right now? I mean, what is yeah. failure right now? The objective, the policy objective was to tighten financial conditions and take out some demand. To do that in a way where we don't get higher unemployment, we don't get a recession. That's really tricky. Especially because right now, that inflation is not coming down on its own. Right now, the labor market is not slowing on its own materially in a way that can give the Fed any comfort. So what do they have to do to get to that end? Looking forward to the coverage through this morning. We'll have a conversation on commodities, on crude more specifically with JP Morgan in just a moment. Looking at crude this morning. Good morning. Crude lower, 112 on WTI. Backing away from 120 earlier in the week. Equities doing OK, up a half of 1%. But it's the oil market once again that gets your attention, Tom. Those two reports, one from the FT, one from the team here at Bloomberg. The FT indicating the Saudis could be getting ready to boost output, reflecting some of the stuff we heard from Dow Jones earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal, of course. And then here at Bloomberg, Tom, a meeting potentially between the President of the United States and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The meeting's way, way important as a symbol, and you really wonder the calculus, and I mean truly the royal calculus the Saudis will have. The royal calculus. Any more to sound yes. the royals? No, no, we're, we're, we're like going down a street. They're like, I think they're on their way to Claridge's for a that, full That's English. the coverage. Yeah, that's the coverage you. of the Jubilee. They're like going down yeah, a street. Yeah, full English, $50, John. <laughs> Claridge, it's you and me and Lisa. Stick around for more of this, eh? <laughs> we'll, we'll have a full English. Al will have the is that, is that Is that the promo? <clears throat> that's, yeah. that's the promo for our Jubilee coverage. <laughs> They're going down a street, a familiar one with a big house at the bottom. And then a family comes out on the balcony and, <laughs> Thank you. and, and waves at a flyby. Oh, John, such a Republican. Teeing it up in a big way, Tom. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The price of oil is falling today following a pair of reports. According to the Financial Times, Saudi Arabia has indicated it's ready to pump more crude should Russian output decline substantially due to increasing sanctions. Meanwhile, President Biden is likely to visit Saudi Arabia this month. That could lead to an increase in Saudi oil production. Soaring gas prices are hurting the president politically. Sheryl Sandberg helped turn Facebook from a startup into a multi-billion dollar advertising powerhouse. Now she's calling it quits. Sandberg is stepping down as chief operating officer of Facebook parent Meta Platforms after 14 years. She served as the highest profile face of the company next to CEO Mark Zuckerberg. But she was criticized for the company's failure to rein in large-scale misinformation and privacy breaches. Russia says it's ready to settle claims on bonds that were judged to have breached their terms after missing a $1.9 million interest payment. It's an attempt to avert an insurance payout potentially worth billions of dollars. The Credit Derivatives Determinations Committee said a failure to pay event occurred on credit default swaps. Russia blames foreign counterparties for that delay. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, police say a gunman killed four people at a medical building, the latest in a series of mass shootings in the U.S. Authorities say the gunman apparently killed himself. It's unclear what led to the attack. Police say they were on the scene about three minutes after getting a report. Global News 24 hours a day. On air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts, I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
labor market is the tightest basically it's ever been, and you can see that by the ratio of unfilled jobs relative to the number of people that are unemployed. The Fed needs to loosen that up, or wage pressures will accumulate, and that will keep inflation above the Fed's 2% inflation objective. That was Bill Dudley, the Bloomberg Opinion columnist, and of course the former New York Fed president. On those job openings, 1.9 for every unemployed individual in this country right now based on the data out yesterday. From New York City this morning, good morning, futures positive, a half of 1% on the S&P. Our attention through most of this morning so far, all over the place. But if you pick a point in the market, it's on crude, 112, WTI, yeah. negative 2.7%. Keep going back to those two reports, Tom, one from here at Bloomberg and a team in Washington pointing out we could have a meeting <clears throat> between the President of the United States and the Crown Prince later this month in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The other report out of the FT, in addition to what we heard from the Wall Street Journal earlier this week, just this idea the Saudis are getting ready, prepared to do more if we need them to. You wonder how OPEC Plus is in three months or in six months. And of course, we all wonder about a gallon of gas as well. We are pleased to bring you on short notice, Christian Malik. Global Energy Strategist at J.P. Morgan Securities. Christian, I want to go to Jamie Dimon's annual report of April of this year, his letter to shareholders, where he talked about the precarious nature of the global energy supply. Simply, that supply is easy to disrupt. We should also keep in mind that as a percentage of global GDP, oil is only about 40 percent of what it was in 1973, but it is still essential and critical. Mr. Diamond has stated there is some level of hurricane out there. In your 100-page treatise, you don't use the word hurricane, do you? No, we don't, we don't use the, the term hurricane. Or it's, it's a fantastic analogy by, by Mr. Diamond. In fact, the key here is we are we look into the future, as we've been really calling for for the best part of two years, we see a world that is short energy, short oil, well before we no longer need it. And I think when you think about the deficits, whether it's wheat, whether it's energy, um, it's all pointing towards a situation where, where basically there will be no solution around mitigating higher prices um, um, and particularly higher inflation across energy. We're, we're basically short all fuels, Tom, and the only one that's available that's fungible, even, even in a limited context, is, is oil, but that doesn't preclude it moving uh, significantly right. higher. At what price Brent crude per barrel does the investment incentive click in with a vengeance? Uh, it's, I think the, the, the oil price needed it has to be over $100 in a sustainable period. I think volatility of this asset class, credibility of this asset class, you know, when you've got uh, COVID concerns or recessionary concerns means that you see a bit of paralysis in the C-suite. Management teams just don't want to press the buzzer on a major project on a sort of 10 to 15 year view at risk of oil prices potentially collapsing. And I think that paralysis means we need a pretty significant risk premium to oil, which I would argue will sit somewhere closer to 120 to 130. So while the fair value could be closer to sort of 80, um, management teams, investors are looking for a pretty big premium in order to qualify. And then of course, you've also got the pressure from ESG and pressure around decarbonizing which, which also doesn't help in the context of uh, investing in long-term projects, because if you do that, you never know whether you'll be in a penalty box in a, few, in a few years' time. Christian, given this lack of investment more broadly, is the market right now overplaying the impact of Saudi Arabia increasing production? Absolutely. We're running to stand still um, on spare capacity. In fact, you know, adding barrels into a market which could see all prices uh, continue to stay overheated and, 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 and as Mr. Diamond mentioned, moving higher over the medium term could actually end up proving premature. Uh, you, you mentioned the 1970s when Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Amani had to manage an energy crisis, uh, God bless his soul. And one of the things that we sort of tend to forget, um, you know, uh, is that when we're at record short, uh, when we're at record low barrels of spare capacity as we are now, um, adding barrels doesn't really help mitigate or help the situation. All you're doing is effectively losing your last line of defense. So I think this is probably where we're at now in terms of it makes very little difference whether you add barrels or not. And that's why I think it's probably likely to sort of keep your powder dry is probably the most appropriate uh, strategy at this point. Christian, when it comes to Russian output, I'd love your input on this. One factor that your team, some colleagues of yours have pointed out is Chinese demand for Russian crude. And that if they don't fill the void, step up and buy that Russian crude and keep taking it from somewhere else, we could have even higher crude prices. Can you walk me through the influence of that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we have a sort of dichotomy between production and exports. Um, production actually hasn't necessarily moved lower over the past few months. However, exports are very logistically challenged. And I think in terms of the reaction function of the buyer, I'd look at it this way, John. You know, if we move into a higher price scenario, uh, as we're calling for, and we're short even more barrels, and countries need energy, they need molecules of energy, and they can't get, they can't get their hands on, uh, on those molecules because they're effectively run out of all other fuels, then that will change the reaction function of these governments towards getting hold of oil. Uh, I think that's an important factor to feature. They may, not have, they may not have any other choice but to secure those barrels in the event that the, the alternative could mean, um, you know, industrial activity uh, winding down, you know, potential social unrest and so on. So I think, in other words, we should expect um, elasticity to those barrels in, in, in the event that the alternative is much worse. Walk me through how to play this through the equity market now, Christian. What's the best way of playing this? The best, the, the, uh, the best way to play this is staying bullish energy equities, not the futures of commodities, energy equities, and here's why. As OPEC adds barrels, that is typically bullish. We may see us, you know, say they do, you know, we could see all prices at the front end move lower, but historically adding barrels or reducing spare capacity is conducive to the back end of the curve. That's where energy equities investors live. They live at the back end of the curve. And if they can see and have more confidence the back end of the curve is going to hold above $80, by virtue of the fact that if you look out into the future, there are, uh, there are just so few barrels out there, that, is, that means that should give confidence for investors to buy the equities because equities trade off the back of the curve. And that's where there's been least confidence, particularly around recession risk. So we stay bullish equities and stay bullish companies who are most geared to, to, to oil and gas prices to benefit and in turn return that cash back to shareholders. You're seeing a massive return back to shareholders. Uh, 30% of market cap in three years is unprecedented. It's in a monster rally as well. A monster, monster rally in this equity market, in that particular part of this equity market. Anyway, Christian, just great work, buddy. As always, love catching up with you from JP Morgan Securities there, Tom, on the path forward, the road ahead. For this oil market. Can't say enough of the report. Get the report, folks. We protect the copyright of all of our guests. Get it from J.P. Morgan. Whether you agree or disagree, it is the thought-provoking report. It created a hurricane of storm, John. We turn now to our royal correspondent, Tom King, for the latest on well, the John, parade. You know, it's, it's really interesting right now. The imagery we've got is of, of the parade, but the Queen has been alone on the balcony. We'll try to get that shot uh, for you here, all by herself. And John, <laughs> that really speaks volumes about the generational shift here that you and your family have lived. Elisa, what are you laughing at? It's an important moment. <laughs> well, is it? Yeah. I mean, the Queen's alone on a balcony. Well, They're wearing hats on horses. She's going to be joined by the minions here in a moment, and the, <laughs> the royal offspring. The minions. It's a celebration, guys. Yeah. She's not alone. She's actually with someone on that balcony, just letting you know. Okay. This is where it's at for this coverage, <laughs> isn't it? The Duke of Kent with the Queen. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning on TV and on radio. Here is the Thursday morning price action about an hour away from the economic data in America. Futures positive by six tenths of one percent on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq 100 up seven tenths of one percent yields. That's where I want to take the conversation in the bond market. All this chatter about peak yields, peak inflation. Look to Europe, a German 10 year yield 120, pushing 123 a little bit earlier this morning. That's the high of the year. We haven't seen the high of the year, perhaps, in Europe just yet, according to Cathy Jones and Charles Schwab. Maybe, though, we're getting closer to it. Your U.S. 10-year, 291. Let's round that one up, Tom. 320 back on May 9th. And all of a sudden, we're having another look at 3% yeah, on a 10-year yield. Yeah, we're not there yet, John. You're right. It's not technically there. But, it, you know, to be honest here, it has been a leap up. The drama's not there. You wonder where the drama will be Monday morning after the jobs report. Friday morning, the focus for us at the moment, Tom, 8.30 Eastern time. Oh, okay. Jobs drop a little bit later, more economic data. The reaction so far has been pretty clear. The data in America, pretty decent. The ISM manufacturing, a nice upside surprise. Job openings come down, still elevated. The quits rate still speaks to that story. There is a confidence in this labor market. 1.9 jobs open, available for every unemployed person in this country right now, according to the recent data. 
here in the US. The story in the bond market looks like that. In the commodity market, it looks like this. Crude lower. We back away from 120 again, a little bit further. 119.98, the highs of the last couple of days of this week, and then we pull back. The why? Several reports. Started with the Wall Street Journal that maybe OPEC Plus could ditch the plus, push away Russia and come to their own agreement on boosting output. That got a boost from a story from the FT suggesting this morning that that might be what we get from Saudi Arabia. They're set to do more. And then I think the politics important here, Tom. Just the idea from the team here at Bloomberg that we could get a meeting between the President of the United States and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. Oh, it would be a big change. I think it's been widely, widely anticipated, and we'll, we'll see what happens. John, I'm just getting used to $100 oil. I watch Mammoth, California, Mammoth Mountain, California, and it's exploded, John, in the last number of days from $6.90 a gallon up to roughly $7.30 a gallon. We've never framed that in America. We just spoke to Christian Malik of JP Morgan, very bullish the crude story, very bullish the energy story, very bullish the energy names that produce all of those goods. Tom, City take the other side of this, and you know that well. Yeah, and more City really world. take the other yeah. side of this, that if we face a real downdraft in economic growth, we have no business, Tom, in triple digits. Well, it's there. Francisco Blanche scheduled to be with us uh, later today. Looking forward to that. WCI 112, Brent crude, about 113. That's the cross-asset price action. Here's a gloomy... <laughs> Full of doom, look, at some single names. Good morning, Bramah. Let's talk about supply chain disruptions. Good morning, there John. We go. Because that is what we're seeing in Hewlett Packard Enterprises. It is a hardware and software company, and it came out with earnings yesterday after the bell. Uh, they, they were talking about supply chain disruptions uh, really impeding their full year forecast. Those shares down nearly 5% ahead of the opening bell. Pfizer is dealing with that uh, shot for kids under the age of five. For COVID, still, you are seeing a bit of softness there have all year actually which is kind of interesting given the fact that we still have COVID around here and Chewy uh, this is just for you Tom 18% gain because they are well, selling lots of stuff to people who have pets it, and, and still have to feed them. Lisa part of this is Chewy is the official feeder for the Royal Corgis I mean part of it's a jubilee play she's I got like highly 14 doubt Corgis I'm and I'm gonna go you know, ahead and doubt that that is true and I'm gonna guess PayPal and feeds them with hills or whatever. So we're also looking at oil stocks right now, not to discount that in any way, shape or form. But I wanted to take a look at some of the big oil companies and how they were doing in light of the fact that you are seeing a dip in crude. And it's about a two and a half to two point six percent loss if you take a look at either uh, WTI or Brent. Actually, shares of the big oil producers in general are not down as much. And that I think is interesting. Occidental is down a bit more than the others, down more than 2%. But Chevron and Exxon down uh, between 1% and 1.7%. John, how much does this really indicate the Christian Malik view of things? That basically this is still the haven, even if you think the city at Morse view is, has some credence. This is the base case, that this is the best hedge against inflation at a time where it seems like commodity prices are going to go up over the long term, despite Despite some barrels coming back online, perhaps from Saudi Arabia. Elisa, what did Chris Verona Stratega say earlier this morning? He said overbought, sure, not overowned. I thought that was of, a really important point. I would agree with that. A lot of people are waiting for the capitulation from the ESG crowd to say, OK, maybe we got to buy these. And they have not seen that fully yet. At what point do you see that to have this, uh, this particular component become a bigger one in the S&P uh, than it has been over the past decade? I have to say that wasn't that gloomy, Tom. <clears throat> That wasn't that gloomy at all. Are you disappointed? No, she's, she's, no you know. fired up about the Jubilee. You know. Is she? Yeah. I, I, to be honest, Tom, I don't think she is at all. Team coverage here will continue to look to London oh, they, for some of the honestly, moments Honestly, they can't wait, Tom. The Jubilee. Edge of the sea stuff, that coverage. Joining us right now, Megan Green, Global Chief Economist at Kroll Institute and Senior Fellow, Harvard Kennedy School. And very importantly, uh, Dr. Green, is the idea here of using the Queen's English. And you do that, Megan, with the word Awkward. You say our awkward response to inflation on a global basis is really interesting. How awkward is the Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell right now? Well, the Fed's in a tough spot, right? You know, we're facing indicators suggesting that growth is really slowing. At the same time, inflation is way too high by the Fed standards, by everyone's standards. And so the Fed is stuck knowing that a lot of the drivers of inflation are, are supply side and that the Fed can't really do much about it. So the Fed's having to hike rates uh, and will hike rates to neutral uh, very quickly, which is around two and a half percent. There's a ways to go before the end of the year. And then I think the Fed's really stuck. They're going to pause, recognize that, you know, another 200 basis points in hikes is a lot for the economy to absorb in a short period of time. 
and see where the data is. So I think it's absolute consensus that the Fed, they'll just go straight to neutral. And then I think they're going to wait and see, as the rest of us will have to as well. I have to say, in all of my conversations with investors, there's been a real shift in focus away from just talking about inflation to just talking about growth over the past two weeks. The concerns about a recession are, are really intense among investors. And, and actually, I think premature. I don't think we're going into recession in the next 12 months. It's the 12 months after that that I'm worried about. Megan, we sense the same thing. Overwhelmingly, the focus is on some of the output data. What did you make of the ISM for manufacturing yesterday? Because not exactly in line with what we've seen from some of the regional Fed indicators. Yeah, and this is happening. I had an investor sort of rant at me uh, yesterday that all the data is contradictory and they don't know what to what signal to read out of the noise. And I, I think we're all feeling that way. But I think the ISM data was fairly positive, actually. It surprised me on the upside and suggests that we're not careening towards a recession. Look, uh, you know, the consumer accounts for 70 percent of our growth in the U.S. And consumer balance sheets are looking pretty healthy in aggregate. Of course, the bottom quartile by income doesn't look that great. They've burned through their cash buffer. Uh, but the rest of Americans have a big cash cushion. Companies also have a huge cash, cash position built up. So even as rates go up in earnings, the risk is all on the downside. It's going to take a while to burn through all of that cash before we really start to see individuals and companies retrench. And, and that is what drives us into recession. Megan. It's also worth pointing out with the jobs data coming up on Friday, we have 11 and a half million unfilled jobs. A tick up in unemployment is the best indicator of a recession. I just don't see unemployment ticking up significantly anytime soon, given how many unfilled jobs there are. Megan, given all of this, why won't the Fed be more aggressive than people think? Why do they why will they potentially be more patient and hike rates enough and then pause? Uh, you know, I think that the Fed knows that their history in terms of engineering a soft landing is pretty poor. And in the past, every time they have actually engineered a soft landing, uh, unemployment was actually much higher when they started. So it's much more likely that unemployment will tick up this time around, just given that it's around three and a half percent. It's it's near historic lows, um, as opposed to in the past where unemployment was already higher. Um, they, they don't want to cause a recession. And that's why they're fine going to neutral. That's just taking their foot off the gas pedal a bit. But once they get to neutral and have to get to, into actual significant tightening, I think they're going to be a lot more cautious. Megan Green of the Kroll Institute. Megan, thank you. Looking ahead to payrolls tomorrow, Lisa, 3.6% on unemployment. And once again, looking for a move down to 3.5%. That is your median estimate so far. So from an economic perspective, it's moving in the right direction. From the Fed's perspective, it's moving in the wrong direction. And this is sort of the push-pull. I mean, Megan's saying that basically they just need to get to neutral and they can wait. Other people saying not so much, including people on the Federal Reserve, actually seeing more urgency to get ahead of this before it becomes more entrenched. And that is the polarity right now for the U.S. Central Bank that I think is important to watch. Well, we can discuss the Fed's projections, or as Kathy Jones called them, of Charles Schwab. What did she call them? The Fed's aspirations. aspirations. <laughs> the Fed's aspirations. They're at 3.5 years. End, Tom. They're at 3.5% unemployment year end again next year and at 3.6% the year after that. And what did our guest say on the Fed show several months ago when we came out with those projections? I believe Diane Swank called it fanciful. Yeah. Yeah, I, John, I, I just think it's a parlor game. And with the uncertainty that we have right now, uh, I, I just don't even want to go there. I would state, as we've heard from a number of guests this morning, not a small matter is the opening of China. I think that's been underplayed. I know The Economist magazine this week has a real feature there on the ramifications of post-lockdown China. Outside of the commodity market, Tom, where do you think it's underappreciated at the moment? The uncertainty that's out there, people put their pants on one leg at a time. There's way too much certitude chatted up right now. I, I, I think... I think the number one, the level of uncertainties, plural, is huge, John. Might be backing away from the shutdown, Lisa. They're not backing away from the approach, though, are they? No, and this was interesting, the news out of Hong Kong, that basically they're starting to quarantine again I in the same kind of way. Yeah. How much does this indicate basically no shift yeah. in the zero COVID policy, that perhaps this is a pause in some of those lockdowns, but not taking it off the table entirely? Front page of the editorial over in China today, Tom. Great achievements have been made in the defense of Shanghai in the People's Daily newspaper. 
That was yeah. the headline. Hey, maybe it's bad medicine. We'll leave it at that. John, Peaky Blinders, they had the Epson Derby in there. That's on Saturday. Is that, John, as big as the Kentucky Derby? Uh, hold, hold on a minute. Have you been watching Peaky Blinders? No, I haven't, but I know you're a big <laughs> fan. I mean, I mean, I just want to know, is the Epsom Derby as big as the Kentucky Derby? No, we have the we have the Grand National, Tom. That's, okay. our, that's our big single race, okay. the Grand National. You missed that earlier this year. I missed Can you that. do a Peaky Blinders accent? No, I can't. Do yeah, that. you can. No, I can't. Come on. No. Practice in the break, and when we come back, Sterling will come back for that. Pound Sterling stronger. Go. Nice. You're a dollar a break of 107 recently. Just getting back to those levels. 106.95. That currency pair up four tenths of one percent from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The price of oil is lower today. There's a report from the Financial Times that Saudi Arabia is ready to increase production if Russia has to cut back substantially due to international sanctions. Meanwhile, President Biden is likely to visit Saudi Arabia this month. He'll almost inevitably meet with a de facto ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who he's shunned so far. That may pave the way for an oil production boost. In Ukraine, the central bank has more than doubled its benchmark interest rate in an attempt to stem inflation in the wake of the Russian invasion. Borrowing costs were raised from 10% to 25, the highest in almost seven years. It was the first rate hike in four months. Inflation in Ukraine soared to 17% in May. More than two-thirds of the world's population probably have significant levels of COVID antibodies. That's according to the World Health Organization, and that means they have either been infected or vaccinated. Most studies say that people who have both been infected with COVID and vaccinated have the best protection against severe outcomes. And Chase Coleman's Tiger Global Management has now lost almost 52% for the year, according to an investor letter seen by Bloomberg News. Tiger Global's main hedge fund plummeted more than 14% in May in the first quarter. The firm cut some of its biggest tech losers, but then added others. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Business continues to be the business it has been for the last decade. And Cheryl ran that very, very well, uh, except for the governance part. <laughs> That's, yeah. you, know, you always right. have to qualify. You, know, you can't really say anything overwhelmingly positive or overwhelmingly negative about Cheryl Sandberg. She was an astonishingly effective leader who had a major blind spot. And she's on her way out. And that was David Kirkpatrick, economy founder and author of the Facebook defect. Overwhelmingly, Tom, the conclusion is that Facebook today is what it is, largely because of the influence of Sheryl Sandberg. The problem is embedded in that inclusion, in that conclusion, Tom, is both an insult yeah. and a compliment. We're going to depend on what your perspective is. Our guest is going to help us here, John. But to step lightly here, we're arranging an 82-gun salute for the Queen coming up here, and I think about six minutes at Hyde Park. You wonder, would there be a gun salute at Menlo Park for uh, an exiting Sandberg? Have you held the stock over the last? 10 years since it went public, maybe, not over the last 12 months. Did and Tom, the stock go up because of her? A massive, massive piece of that aggressive pursuit of ad revenue, Tom, is down to that one individual, without sure. a doubt. Now, let's advance this topic here and really advance it into technology and media as a whole. We can do that with true perspective from Brian Weezer, global president of Bloomberg Intelligence. Folks, this is why you watch Bloomberg. You get Kirkpatrick early in the morning, and then Weezer follows on with some brilliant perspective. Who will replace Sheryl Sandberg? Well, it's an individual named uh, Javier Olivan, um, but it's clearly not just one person replacing what uh, Sheryl Sandberg had as a role 15 years ago. I mean, her role is, uh, we were just joking about it, you know, is distributed. Her responsibilities were really distributed over the last four or five years in particular. I think it's a mystery of how Mr. Zuckerberg runs the shop. It's, it's Elon Musk, Elon Musk, Elon Musk, 24-7. How does Zuckerberg run Facebook and what kind of Sheryl Sandberg does he need next? You know, it's interesting. Five and more years ago, people like me would have been debating just how much in control was Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, just how much. And because Sandberg did have so much of power and authority uh, over so much of the business, 
the reality is this was Zuckerberg's business. It remains his. And that is, at the end of the day, he has people who are going to execute what he wants to see happen. There are going to be all sorts of speculation as to why she's leaving now, Brian. She does say that she wants to work more on philanthropy. She wants to uh, more commit herself to her new stepchildren, her family, etc. Is there a more marked <clears throat> shift in now Meta uh, that perhaps doesn't jibe with a sort of nuts and bolts approach that she took? I think they're clearly trying to move into directions that are different than anything she ever worked on. That's that's for sure. That's not a reason to move on, though. I mean, I think, you know, there's been enough speculation that, you know, I can only say is probably as accurate as anyone else could say it um, in terms of whether she would have moved on had uh, Clinton won the election 16. Um, maybe there would have been reasons to do something sooner for a bunch of other reasons, you know, because of all the challenges that they had. Um, at the end of the day, I, I don't know that it's the change of business that's the, the catalyst for uh, for the change. But I think it's clear that Zuckerberg wants to move the business in a different direction. The advertising business, although as important as it is, it's, it's everything from a revenue perspective. From from our client's perspective, it's still a really important media partner. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's not the thing that Zuckerberg's focused on. He's focused on connecting people for good and for bad. Brian. Do you think that Sheryl Sandberg holds a lot of the blame for emphasizing ad revenue and, frankly, just volume and traffic over a lot of concerns, social concerns, with respect to the influence over entire societies as well as children? Well, what's the saying? Success has a thousand fathers or mothers, and uh, uh, the opposite has probably only a few people to blame. No, I, I, I think that the consequences are pretty widely distributed. I mean, the responsibilities for consequences that we've seen uh, of all the bad things that really have been associated with Facebook over the years are, are not just one person's responsibility. I mean, if they are, you could say it's Mark Zuckerberg's. But there's so many different uh, uh, factors at play. I don't think you could just pin it all on one person. Brian, the elephant in the room of the last 12 months, if you hold the stock, is the performance of the name. It's been terrible. It's been brutal. Piper Sander out this morning, cutting the price targets on Snap, on Pinterest, downgraded to neutral from overweight, off the back of what they see as slowing digital advertising spend, given the headwinds in the industry. What do you make of what's going on at the moment for this name, for others too, exposed to the world that Sheryl Sandberg, ultimately the industry, she helped create? Yeah, I, I think here the issue is one of expectations, and uh, where do you uh, divide up and distribute the blame for that one? Uh, I think the reality is they had this ridiculously strong pandemic. They did so incredibly, so much better than you could have realistically expected. Um, they did catalyze some growth, but I think they cap capitalized on circumstances that were way outside of their control. The digitalization of the economy during the pandemic was not something that they caused, uh, but they <clears throat> certainly benefited from. So there's that. I think that too few people understand or appreciate just how difficult the comparables were from the first quarter of 2021 when they slowed down to a single digit growth rate after they grew almost 50% at the size they're at. So there's a mismatch of expectations. I'm sure the company uh, had a mismatch of expectations too, but investors almost certainly did. Uh, and that's, I think, where, where we are with the, the stock. Brian, just quickly, what's Alphabet getting right in that world? Alphabet gets a lot of things right. Well, first of all, they're more exposed to where the economy is at this moment in time, right? There's more of a skew towards services rather than products that helps. Uh, they're less dependent on the e-commerce rep based revenue that Facebook uh, was dependent on. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, though, and maybe this goes to a bigger issue, Google's gone through an extra generation of management. It is not an individually controlled company for practical purposes. It is, you know, has professional management throughout. I mean, yes, Facebook does too, but it's an extra generation deeper, if you will. And so there's just more uh, diversification. Um, they're just better exposed to where the economy is in general. Brian, wonderful to catch up. As always, Brian Weiser there, the global president of business intelligence over at Group N. Just to go through that Piper Sandler call, Snap and Pinterest cut, downgraded to neutral from overweight. Alphabet, Tom, they called it the star yeah. of the show. John, I just did on Facebook, and this goes with David Kirkpatrick joining Bloomberg this morning to the day they went public, and I had Kodrowski and Kirkpatrick on set. John, Facebook now is down to a 17% return over life of fun per year, and they are three standard deviations off the trend. That's I don't care who you are, John. If you're a CEO, that is unacceptable. The last 12 months, Lisa, yeah. has been absolutely brutal for that name.
You have both the retracement of the pandemic gains, but you also have a lot of companies not advertising as much because they don't have the goods to actually sell, right? We heard this as an excuse for Snap that basically the supply chain disruptions and the lack of supply has led some companies to pull back <clears throat> with their advertising revenue despite the incredible demand. How much is that going to be a persistent theme? Futures right now up a half of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq 100 up 7 tenths of 1%. The price action developing as follows, going into the opening bell and a little bit of economic oh. data later this morning at 8.30 Eastern time. Yields unchanged at 2.90.58. The trend yesterday pretty clear. Upside surprise on ISM manufacturing. That drove yields higher, treasuries lower. Just this conclusion, Tom, that every time we get a strong data point, this Fed's got more work to do in the minds of this market. Absolutely, but you know we've had some weak data points as well. I think it's indeterminate right now, and what we're going to see here in 35 minutes is the beginning of two days of data that matters. I mean, there's just no question about it, John. On to payrolls tomorrow morning. Big focus for us this morning. Crude just about holding on to 112, negative 2.8%. A report here at Bloomberg that we could have a meeting between the President of the United States and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, perhaps later this month. The report out of the FT that the Saudis are getting ready to push output up just a little bit more. We'll get the thoughts of Brian Nick and Nuvi very shortly. Heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. We haven't seen the recession manifest in the macro data yet. So we still think there's a path for the US economy to have a soft rather than a hard landing. Given these food costs, these energy costs, our falling income, we will be in a recession within the next six months. We have a labor market that's unprecedentedly tight. The Fed needs to loosen that up or wage pressures will accumulate. They need to front load these rate hikes as much as possible. People are worried about these rate hikes, but they're already priced into the market. It's what happens from here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramis, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. We welcome you to America in New York on a day of job claims and on to the jobs report this morning. John, we are data dependent. We are, and we're looking for some more data a little bit later this morning. The ADP report about 15 minutes away, Tom. On to jobless claims at 8.30 Eastern time. On to tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern, with a payrolls report and an unemployment rate, Tom, predicted by many to yes. come down to 3.5%. And what is so interesting is the trend of that to 3.5% is away from what the Fed really wants. Many people talking about a need for a 4% unemployment rate. Most Americans, John, don't agree with that. Tom, you've seen how this market is digesting the economic data in the last 24 hours. You get a strong data point, the ISM manufacturing, you get treasuries lower, yields higher. We've talked about that conclusion. <clears throat> this Fed has more to do. Let's frame up the data, John. We've got to go to hydrocarbons here, particularly with Christian Malik joining us in the last hour from JP Morgan. Diamond says it's a hurricane out there, and the hurricane starts with 113 Brent crew. Yeah, and let's face it, this White House, Tom, has been amidst <clears throat> in the middle of that hurricane for the whole year so far. That hurricane for them is inflation. High crude prices, high gas prices, they want to do something about it. The report from the team here at Bloomberg suggesting the White House, the President of the United States, could be meeting with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. Tom, I think that is a really important development in the last 24 hours. And Lisa, what's so, so interesting here is the unequal application of 8% inflation across society. It's not fair, is it? No, it hits the lowest income the hardest. How does the Fed deal with that, especially when they tend to get hit hardest also mm -hmm. when the unemployment rate rises? Look, this has been a conundrum for a long time, and this was a very socially conscious Fed that suddenly is a lot less socially conscious at a time where inflation is the main uh, issue. And so how much are they going to basically put nuance aside, put divergence within the labor market aside as they say, look, we need to get price stability under control, and that is our first and foremost issue. Cheryl, Cheryl I'll get it out. Three, two, one. My Cheryl. Cue. Sandberg would not know credit if it hit her over the head. Lisa, an update on credit versus full faith in credit. Honestly, there's actually been a rally. And this goes to this whole feeling that you're going to get not necessarily a soft landing, but the Fed is going to A better pause. feeling. A better feeling. And you yeah. saw that in risk it's assets nice. generally last year. It's such a nice feeling. It's a, it's a nice move. It's nice. Yeah, but that honestly, I think... was a nice move, wasn't it? <laughs> it was such a lovely move. There is this issue, though, Tom, mm -hmm. that Megan Green was talking about, that the Fed has taken lessons from previous history and basically will just raise rates to neutral and then wait. Drew Mattis of MetLife sent me a fantastic message basically saying when you miss the bus, you don't jump on a moving one. 
basically they got it too late and now they're trying to figure out how to catch up and they have to really thread a needle that's already pretty narrow. How do they move forward? Uh, we'll have to see. A uh, data check. How about a, uh, a large devaluation in the British pound since the beginning of the Queen's reign? Right now, the Queen enjoying, John, a 125.54 on pound sterling. A nice move in this equity market again, Tom, up a half of 1% on the S&P. Lisa keeps saying that every morning. Nice move. The Nasdaq up by nice seven tenths of 1%. Okay, believe. can we set the record straight? Please do. That you were the one that said nice move. I don't remember and it being I that laughed, way. And I laughed and I said nice, so nice. And now it's my commentary? Yeah, you thought, I thought you thought it was a nice move. No? You didn't think it was? Show's come to a complete halt. <laughs> I'm confused. Did you, not, did you not think it was a nice move? Let's save, let's save the show right now, <laughs> folks. Give me some Jubilee action here. Come on, Amy, cue it up. They're doing a flyover here. This is their landing at Heathrow coming in with British Air uh, right now. And, of oh course, my. the royal family and the royal offspring, John, on the balcony. The working royals, Tom. I believe we're going to have a flyover of 70 aircraft right now. for every yes. year of the Queen <laughs> on the throne. And with yep. that little kid. Exciting stuff, Charlotte, Tom. Lewis, they're all wearing Rachel Riley this morning. They're styling. Packed outside of Buckingham Palace, Tom. Pack. Thank you. The There's your Jubilee Packed. coverage here with Prince Charles. Uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, and this is the wave I'm going with, John. It's been working all morning. The royal wave. You're, the royal wave. You've been I'm, I'm, I'm that, taking you? this off of the Duchess of Cambridge. People often reach out to me and well. talk about how much preparation do you have to do? And I'll say, well, Lisa and I do a lot of reading, a lot of reading. And I know what you were doing this morning in the mirror. Just, just yeah. practicing. Well, the Queen Mother would do this, show. you know, on radio. This is really working on radio, but the, I, I was going to go with the Queen Mother uh, look. You know, Seriously. Tom, Tom, my, the Italian influence in my family, that <clears throat> kind of meant something, <laughs> something else. That's how I grew up. It wasn't there, this. It was, there, would you like to you add know? any more to the Jubilee? Remember, the, the offspring are listening. You are so done. We will continue here with the pageantry. We thank Queen Victoria Street for their services this morning and covering a moment for Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth II. Brian Nick is like, when do I get some airtime? Joining us now, Chief Investment Strategist at Nuveen. Brian, in equities, people are trying to guess a bottom. In the bond market, how do you guess a bottom which leads to price up, yield down? I think really what, what we need to see is what you were just talking about, which is the data coming in that's strong but not too strong. The more of these, these, these numbers that we get that show that the economy is slowing but not cratering, not crashing into recession, just sort of normalizing, the better that's going to be taking pressure off the Fed, taking upward pressure off the 10-year. And that is sort of the, 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 the release point for relieving stress on the equity markets, credit markets. And we know what happens to Fed funds futures as well. We start to see a little bit of a of a, of a downward move there, maybe some of those 50 basis point hikes from later this year getting priced out, looking more like 25 or maybe even a pause. And that is the the, the release valve on the pressure um, that, I, that I think is is what's going to mark, again, the top for the 10-year and the bottom for the S&P 500. We may have already seen it, but I think the more data that we get, like the ISM yesterday, the JOLTS data yesterday, the more uh, the more work, as you said, the Fed's going to need to think about doing with rates. Brian, I'm trying to stay open-minded about this. And I look at the economic data at the moment. There seems to be something for everyone. You mentioned the ISM manufacturing and the job openings. Others would point to the regional Fed prints and they would say that things aren't as strong as they seem. How do you put together that conflicting, that contradictory economic data we're getting in America? We have a conflict between the soft survey data right now and the hard data, what people are actually doing, businesses and, and consumers. I always default to believing the hard data. Um, but I think job security is really the name of the game here. I think it's not just the job market, the unemployment rate, the jolts openings, how secure do people feel in the job they have? Because frankly, most people who want to be working are working and probably have gotten a little bit of a pay bump, but again, are paying higher prices at the pump or paying higher rents. Um, what gives them the confidence to continue spending X gasoline on everything else and keeping the economy moving? It's in the jolt state of the yesterday that we saw it's very few layoffs and, and sort of involuntarily uh, separations uh, still ongoing. If we if we see destruction in job openings, but not an actual job creation, I think the consumers carry us through because the, if you're c relatively comfortable that you're going to be able to stay in your job, even if you're not going to be able to easily find a new one, you're probably going to keep spending and the savings rate can continue to come down. The accumulated savings that people got during the pandemic can continue to wind down and keep this economy moving. From a market perspective, Brian, is this a good or bad thing that the consumer still has a lot of cash still ready to go? It's definitely a mixed bag, but I would say it's a good thing for now. Now that the Fed is deliberately uh, raising rates quite quickly towards some semblance of neutral, we'd much rather have consumers have cash on the sidelines than not. But there's not 
that's not true across the board, obviously. If we look at the lower end of the wage scale, these are people where I think wage growth has been typically better in these types of jobs. But the accumulated savings during the pandemic has probably been spent much more quickly. And we're seeing people dip into uh, borrowing and dramatically lower their uh, their ongoing savings rates. So it's, it's a mixed bag across the spectrum in terms of what the consumer looks like. And this is one reason why we prefer to be in the U.S. economy, exposed to the U.S. economy versus other places where food and energy prices bite a lot more. And you haven't seen the wage increases to match the price increases. So in Europe, they haven't had high wage growth. They've had the same kind of inflation we have. That means their consumer, I think, is going to come out of this or has already come out of this a bit weaker than ours here in the U.S. Brian, let's wrap it up by getting to the market call. JP Morgan's Marko Kalanovic said this yesterday. Despite the steep sell-off, we believe that markets will recover year-to-date losses and result in a broadly unchanged year. What has to go right for that to happen? And is that something you can get behind? I really want to believe that view. I think that would make me an optimist at this point. Uh, we're, you know, we're down 13 or 14% to see that rally uh, over the balance of the year on the S&P and get back to flat would be wonderful. I think what probably needs to happen here is you need to get the sort of, the sort of you know, threading the needle from the Fed probably 50 basis point hikes over the summer and then decelerating to 25 uh, or nothing by the end of the year and and not having that happen in the context of a dramatic weakening in the economy. So a continued fall in job openings, continued job creation, uh, job security for people who have those jobs, rising wages and falling gasoline prices would be nice, but it doesn't seem like that that's going to happen in a dramatic way uh, anytime soon. I think that's what gets us to the confidence. I think we get to that September hinge point where the Fed can take its foot off the brake just a little bit. I think that's when the market rally can, can really begin. But we've already seen it. I mean, the credit markets uh, are, are behaving better. We think that might be sort of a half measure for investors that want to get in a little bit uh, risk on, but don't want to be taking the full risk of being exposed to another equity downdraft. Credit markets at least are paying you a coupon while you wait for that to happen. Brian Nick of Nuveen with an elegant way of saying no. <laughs> Lisa, it's going to be very difficult. <laughs> He's to get that money to you. Very good. I mean, that was beautiful. Very good. I like that. Was that, was, was that a slap for me, though? Or was that? <laughs> that was. That, that was that the right way. Which one Rick. was it? I like that. A we royal get way. our guests to do that for the next few days. <laughs> that works out, Tom. Yeah, it works. It works out good. John, an important note here. Current foreign exchange tells you so much. John, sterling to dollar. We all know there's been a devaluation of pound sterling, 280 down to 126 over the span of the Queen's cor- uh, from the coronation, I should say. Look at Swiss franc, John. It's a different number set, but from 12.24 down to 1.20. What does that say about the strength of the Swiss franc? It says a lot about it, Tom. Wow. Just wow. And an wow. S&B who definitely wants to see it. Did I do okay on way. that, John? I thought it was beautiful. I Wave all the Boy FX George. analysis. Which yeah. one? Yeah. Wave. You want to wave us out? Oh, wave us out. Wave us out, Tom. Although, although Boy George is doing the clapping with the Dutch, his mother, the Duchess of Cambridge, so we can clap That's too close out. to the Communist Party. With the, with, <laughs> true. <laughs> no, that's more like this. Elbow, that? elbow, wrist, wrist. Is that Politburo? That's, that's more of a together. party that's congress. North, that's North Korea, When right? we go to Shanghai for the party congress, John, the three of us on the balcony of the Peace Hotel will be happening. doing this. <laughs> I'm fairly confident that's not happening. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world through the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The price of oil is falling today following a pair of reports, according to the Financial Times. Saudi Arabia has indicated it's ready to pump more crude should Russian output decline substantially due to increasing sanctions. Meanwhile, President Biden is likely to visit Saudi Arabia this month. That could lead to an increase in Saudi oil production, soaring gas prices are hurting the president politically. Sheryl Sandberg helped turn Facebook from a startup into a multi-billion dollar advertising powerhouse. Now she's calling it quits. Sandberg is stepping down as chief operating officer of Facebook parent Meta Platforms after 14 years. She served as the highest profile face of the company next to CEO Mark Zuckerberg, but she was criticized for the company's failure to rein in large-scale misinformation and privacy breaches. Russia says it's ready to settle claims on bonds that were judged to have breached their terms after missing $1.9 million in interest payments. It's an attempt to avert an insurance payout potentially worth billions of dollars. The Credit Derivatives Determinations Committee said a failure to pay event occurred on credit default swaps. Russia blames foreign counterparties for that delay. And new data suggests that U.S. housing supply hit a turning point last month, according to realtor 
Realtor.com, home listings increased for the first time in almost three years. The number of acting listings rose 8% from last May. Still, listings remain more than 48% below their level two years ago. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Runaway inflation at the gas pump and at the grocery counter has been the uh, lead indicator for recession of the last six recessions in the United States. If the United States is not currently in recession, given these food costs, these uh, energy costs are falling income, we will be in a recession within the next six months. Stephen Shork there of the Shork Group, the president on this crude market and a whole lot more in this economy. Good morning to you. Equity futures are positive by four tenths of one percent, about a minute away from ADP data. We'll get to that in a moment. Crude 114.59, erasing some of the losses wow. this morning, down about six tenths of one percent. I want to go through things piece by piece if you're just tuning in. We had a report from the FT suggesting that Saudis could be ready to boost more. A report from the team here at Bloomberg suggesting the president could meet with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman later this month. And then moments ago, this headline, OPEC plus to discuss adding 600,000 barrels a day to the oil market in July, according to delegates. This proposal, Tom, against a scheduled 430,000 a day increase. So that's some of the news just kind of dripping yeah. out of this meeting today. And I blended in, John, again to Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is very good math, is up nicely this morning, not quite to the middle of April new highs, but those indices blended oil and away from oil are frankly quite, quite, uh, they're, they're, they're pushing up to record highs. It's clearly recovery this market highs. wants to see more from this cartel. Crude right now, 114.45. Yes. We're down six or seven tenths of 1%. We've got an ADP report, Tom. It is a downside surprise. 128,000, the estimate 300K, the previous number 247. Setting us up, kind of, for payrolls kinda. tomorrow morning. Kind of. 325, kinda. the estimate going into tomorrow, the previous number 428. So, Lisa, that's a downside surprise on the ADP report. Do we care? Does anybody care? Does anyone trade you, on the ADP You kind of alluded report? to that earlier this morning. I mean, morning. honestly, ADP uh, data has been incredibly uh, volatile, Jeez, and people tend to not too. really trade off of it, which is the reason why it's very hard to read. Are people going to try to make something mm. of this? Sure, because they're looking for data, and they're saying they're data dependent, and so this is data. But honestly, I just, I'm just i sorry to point this, but honestly, what correlation has there ever been between ADP and jobs I, I don't think you have to apologize for anything. I think most people listening to everything you just said, Never Lisa, apologize to me. would probably agree with you would agree with everything you've just said. Well, we've got to work out, though, if we get that kind of downside surprise tomorrow, is that an indication of weakness or just the fact the labour market and the gains are going to mature anyway, Tom? Is that what we should expect? Should we be more focused on what happens <clears throat> elsewhere I, with unemployment, yes, with wages? elsewhere. I'm going to look at wages, and what I'm going to look at here in 14 minutes is unit labour costs. It's a goofy part of the productivity report. I know it's dated Q1 and all that. I'm sorry. I'm going to look at unit labour costs to see how they adjust. I just want to point out that uh, a terminal user did write in saying we do care about ADP. So I you found corrected. I, I found a person found who cares about ADP. So okay. there you go. You found one. I see you. I, I mean, I'm surprised you found one <laughs> anymore. <laughs> no, I just got one. Right in. I'd like to find more than one. <laughs> Tom, equity futures up by four tenths of 1% on ESP, on the NASDAQ 100, up a half of 1%. Just a check in of bond yields yesterday off the back of some pretty decent data. Yields were higher. Yields on a 10 year right now look like this, up about a half a basis well, point on a 10 year to 291. John, as you prepare for the real yield, somebody out on Twitter is saying it was far more important than Bloomberg surveillance. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but the real yield has had a sprightly week with a 0 0.26, and that's certainly not going in a gloom direction that's firmed up is how I'd put it. Well, one thing I thought would develop this year, and I think was the consensus view coming into 2022, it was don't fight the Fed. And what did that mean? We all that's thought that the Federal Reserve would be going after inflation, hammering inflation and driving real yields higher in a much more material way. And I have yeah. to say, Tom, I kind of stalled out <clears throat> recently. What are we at now? Positive 25 basis points? Yeah. Maybe not yeah. at the levels people expected. <clears throat> Well, we'll have to see that on the fixed income front. What we've tried to do is inform you about the commodity crisis you're living out front first. 
was Francisco Blanche, and I remember the day a number of quarters ago where he shocked the world over $100 a barrel. He's provided real intellectual leadership on trying to figure out where the next gallon of gas is going to be priced. Francisco, thank you for joining this morning. I want to go to the heart of your note, Francisco. You've got to buy us upward in price, and you are looking at the price responsiveness the price elasticity of demand. Are we going to see demand destruction as oil moves up, or is it inelastic? Uh, look, Tom, I mean, high prices always fix high prices. So we are certainly going to see some demand destruction. One of the challenges, and you may remember the, the, this from back, back in 08 when we were talking about these issues, is that as prices go up, Governments tend to use uh, fuel subsidies as a tool to keep uh, uh, people happy. So we are seeing uh, a curtailment of, of fuel taxes across much of Europe. We've also seen some U.S. states doing the same thing, uh, Mexico, uh, many emerging markets. So as prices go up, governments try to reduce that elasticity, and they don't let prices work very much. And, and therefore, you end up getting bigger movements on the wholesale market, uh, which is kind of what we've right. seen so far. Um, so that's being a big issue. And the other big issue, obviously, is that we, we have, as I like to say, the mother Russia of full supply shocks. Uh, it, it's just a very, very big right. supply shock. Uh, Francisco, I got to go here because Brian Moynihan in Davos was exceptionally positive on the resiliency of the American consumer. Do you care about the price elasticity and demand destruction as gasoline goes to seven dollars a gallon? I, I do care, but but I will say that if you look across the world, and this is probably one of the, one of the, the our most popular uh, pieces of work, which is the, the energy share uh, of of GDP uh, across the world, is actually quite high. We're almost back to the run revolution levels for the entire planet in terms of the the amount of income that we spend in our energy. I'm talking about quantities of oil, gas, and coal multiplied by the price and divided by a nominal GDP. But in the U.S., you have a twist, and the twist is that you haven't had the global gas and power crisis that we've seen in Europe, that we've seen in Asia. So the U.S. is not enduring uh, record high natural gas or power prices. And I know Henry helps up, but uh, at the end of the day, the U.S. is not facing the same kind of energy prices in aggregate that the rest of the world's uh, suffering from. So I think the U.S. is a lot less exposed. Uh, plus, also remember, um, the dollar is very, very strong. So that means uh, America has been insulated also more so than other countries um, that are facing this incredibly uh, strong dollar and strong commodity prices. And perhaps the third fact here is that uh, um, the U.S. Is, is energy independent on its path to become energy dominant, uh, which, which in my mind uh, also shields uh, the, the U.S. from the vagaries of, of global energy prices. So, so I think, yes, we're going to see recessions, but the question is where and when. And the U.S. is probably, in my mind, uh, at, at the bottom of the list in terms of the countries that will be impacted by this uh, skyrocketing energy prices. So, Francisco, there's a lot to unpack there. I want to just first get your sense of how close we are to a full-blown, as you call it, 1980s-style oil crisis. Right. We're, we're not that far. I mean, I think we've seen the global gas and power crisis already uh, in the past 12 months. It started with thermal coal in China. I remember uh, the most expensive energy commodity ain't oil. It's really been uh, uh, thermal coal and, and natural gas. Uh, we are at $400 a ton of thermal coal. That's twice the level of what we saw back in the financial crisis in 08, when oil went to $147 a barrel. We Again, $400 a ton. That's about $100 per barrel of oil equivalent. Uh, so oil at $110, $115 ain't expensive when coal's almost the same price level. Um, and then natural gas has also been at record levels in Europe. Uh, we've seen nearly $500 a barrel of natural gas prices, about uh, 80 bucks an MMBTU at the highest back in March. So, so that's what the real issue is. Oil is, uh, is yet not in crisis. It could go into a crisis, though. And I think, I think that's the real problem here with, with the way that sanctions may be implemented, how much Russian supply do we end up losing, and how, how can that impact uh, the, the, uh, the, the supply demand balances here? That's what I'm worried about. Francisco, I'd love some real-time analysis from you on the headlines we're getting from OPEC+. Plus. Delegates indicating that they could be discussing an additional 600,000 barrels a day against the scheduled 430,000. Also, some indication they might decide today on July and August hikes. Francisco, I'll tell you what the market's doing off the back of this. It's a raising losses. Crude's down about six-tenths of 1%. WTI back to 114.50. What's your read on those kind of headlines? 
Well, my, my read is that uh, OPEC, uh, OPEC plus collectively does not want to be blamed for uh, oil prices skyrocketing here on the back of the uh, European sanctions on Russia. So they're trying to uh, increase produc uh, production and mitigate the upward price pressures. But remember, one of the biggest challenges that OPEC has in this market is that it doesn't have a spare refining capacity. Russia is not only the world's second largest crude oil exporter, it's also the second largest refined petroleum product exporter. And 40% of the diesel that goes into the ICE contract, into the gas oil contract, the most important diesel contract in the world, ICE gas oil, is actually Russian. So uh, you're taking a lot of supply out of, out of a very tight market. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, when you don't have the refining capacity available in Europe sanctioned both crude and petroleum products, um, there's not that much that OPEC can do. They can try to keep a lid on crude oil, but that's not necessarily going to help um, the price of diesel, the price of gasoline, which is ultimately what people buy at the pump. Well, Francisco, just a final word from you then on that topic. OPEC can't do anything seemingly to influence the price of things at the gas, according to what you just said, because of refining capacity. Where does it leave the administration here in the United States as the president, according to our reporting, gears up for a meeting with a crown prince? What can the president do here in America? Well, look, I mean, I think, I think we continue to do what, what we've seen, uh, release a little bit of SPR. Uh, the SPR has some barrels of, of petroleum product available, which are, are being, uh, being released into the market. I think, I think the challenge is, uh, honestly, is that, that we, are, uh, uh, we are tight on every front. Uh, commercial inventories are very low, as are government inventories, because we're drawing them quickly. So I think, I think perhaps uh, you know, we should be started thinking about uh, demand rationing measures, uh, maybe uh, stop subsidizing fuels, uh, but more importantly, maybe think about uh, limiting uh, speed on highways and, and doing things that actually... You think, Francisco, uh, that's where this could go in this country, demand rationing? Uh, well, maybe, maybe not in the U.S., maybe you have enough capacity in the U.S., but certainly other parts of the world, I think, are going to have to end up seeing some demand rationing. Um, yeah, I, th I think so. I think we're going into demand rationing mode uh, on the back of, of, of these measures against Russia. Yeah. Well, Francisco, great to catch up. A longer conversation needs to be had. Francisco Blanche yes. there of Bank of America. Tom, can you imagine that happening here? No, I cannot imagine it happening here. We're huge. We underestimate, John, how sophisticated, dense, and huge the U.S. economy is. To the beginning of the conversation, when Francisco Blanche talks about the government support for their people on hydrocarbons or, in, say, in Egypt on wheat, that's the tip price. There's a kink. There's a, there's a moment where the price of oil precludes that government support. That's the political tension. Can you imagine the polls, Lisa, if that took place? <laughs> no, although we are seeing that in Nigeria. They halted certain airlines in order to avoid having even higher jet fuel uh, surcharges. Equity futures this morning, and good morning to you. We are positive about four tenths of one percent. Jobless claims in America up next. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you. Equity futures shaping up as follows. We're positive by four tenths of 1% on the S&P 500, on the NASDAQ 100, up a half of 1%. Waiting for some economic data in America. The ADP report out moments ago with a downside surprise. Unit labor costs for the first quarter come in punchy at 12.6%. The previous read 11.6%. Claims come in with the right kind of downside surprise, 200K. 210 was the estimate. 210 was the previous number as well. 200K, Tom is the number. As I say, that's the right kind of downside surprise on jobless claims, TK, as they started to kick just a little bit higher over the last few weeks. Off the back of that, no big moves. Yields in about a basis point on a 10-year to 289.49. Yeah. New look on unit labor costs and productivity, John, from 11.6% unit labor costs out to 12.6%. That's going in the wrong inflation way. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. They're just... There's going to be a lot of data, John. It's really important. I think the 200 statistic, you know, it matters. I, mean, Lisa, I don't know what else to say. And to, to answer to what Tom's just said, to get to 35,000 feet, you look at the data, yeah. you see claims going lower, you see the inflationary component to the story. I know it's the first quarter and it's a bit dated. It just speaks to what we were talking about yesterday. This Fed's got work to do. Yeah. And this Fed's got work to do. 
And right now, there is no sign of a job market that is <laughs> tightening up, uh, that is loosening up materially. And honestly, the fact that we're seeing uh, continuing claims yeah. drop to the lowest going back to 1969, you could say because people aren't eligible anymore for unemployment benefits. You could also say people are not getting laid off. They are getting reemployed right, right away. How much does that really factor into what we hear from the Federal Reserve? And Lisa, you observe we go back to 1969? Yes. That's that's what that's we're the seeing only in terms in continuing claims that it's the lowest since 1969. Yes. I mean, honestly, I'm just putting this into perspective in terms of the historical, uh, the it, historical it path. It sounded like a yes or no question, Tom. Thank it you. It did sound John, like I a yes or no question. I mean, it, it did. And then Tom looked like he can't hear us. In fact, Tom still looks like he can't hear us. Can you hear us I don't okay? Know. I was asking about the Queen's Lowner bag. I oh, think you were the distracted. bag that she has today on the surprise. balcony goes back to <laughs> 1969. I was asking about claims. Let's save it with uh, Please do. Stephen Rusciuto <laughs> right now, Chief U.S. Economist at Mizzou Security. Steve, I got eight ways to go here, but let's just get it out of the way. The Rusciuto recession call, where is it? Well, we don't have a recession call. We have a hard landing call. We have what we call a growth recession. If you think about it, we're down 1.5 percent negative GDP in the first quarter. We think second quarter GDP is down and below one and three quarter percent. And in fact, we think GDP every one of the next four quarters is below the CBO's estimate of trend. That's a growth recession. Is it possible we get another one quarter of negative GDP somewhere out over the next four quarters? Yes. We're not going to have a recession. There are no fundamental imbalances to give us a classical recession. Are we at a point where the Fed, with all of the parlor game going on, should just raise rates, not like an emergency, but just come out here and get it done right now so we can move on? Or do they really stay on a meeting schedule? Well, they will stay on a meeting schedule. You have to remember, forward rates have already moved dramatically. And I think forward rates that reverse some of the uh, tightenings in the last couple of uh, weeks will start to unfold in here and go back to where they were. James Bullard keeps on pushing the envelope to 350 by the end of the year. If you look at the forward rates, the market's getting us closer to 3% by the end of the year. So that's, that, that's pretty well discounted into the marketplace. And to a certain extent, you are seeing a ubiquitous impact in terms of some of the more interest rate sensitive sectors starting to take place. You're seeing it in autos and you're seeing it in housing. Uh, now, getting back to Lisa's comp question earlier about the labor market showing it, when you look back in history, you always see tops in a nice, evolving, smooth pattern. But when you live through them, they're much more of a discontinuous drop in activity. So I think as we get further into this summer, you're going to see that discontinuous drop from the cumulative effect of the rate hikes that are already being discounted in the market. But so far, Stephen, if we are seeing what the Fed is going to do being priced into the market, is it working? Do we have any evidence that it is working to either slow the labor labor market or slow inflation? Well, again, you have to slow the demand side in order to then slow the labor market environment. You know, payroll employment and things of that nature are at best a coincident indicator. So to the extent that you're taking aggregate demand down and you're going to have a couple of quarters, several quarters of below trend GDP, that is going to have an impact on the labor market. It's just not going to have an impact on the labor market as quickly as markets would like, which is the reason why when you look at what's happening in terms of the market betting last week that the Fed was reaching an inflation point, that was much too premature. And they took out some of the rate hikes uh, for the end of the year as a result of that speculation. And I think that speculation is going to be fully reversed and more rate hikes are going to be discounted in as we go forward in here in the next couple of months. So there's a lot to unpack. You know, honestly, I'm looking right now at the idea of a Fed pause at a time when we have to wait for the data to show that we're getting some sort of slowdown, some sort of halt to inflation. There isn't the political will for the the Federal Reserve to be patient, right? I mean, how much more aggressive do they have to be, given that it's going to take time for there to be any effect from what they're doing? Well, again, th th this becomes an interesting thing. When you look at the time it takes, we are very impatient. Uh, when you consider the fact that you have a fiscal tightening going on, a currency tightening going on, a monetary policy tightening going on, and we're already seeing a broad effect on interest rate sensitive sectors, and we're only six months into it, that's a shorter lag than normally occurs in monetary policy. So I think over the next couple of months, you're going to see that momentum of the drag increase. 
Um, and that's what's going to be necessary to take the labor market down, to take the uh, inflationary pressures off the equation. But if, look, inflation's not going to come down quickly. And this goes back to Tom's original point about uh, the non-farm payroll numbers uh, in terms of the, the productivity and unit labor cost numbers. You know, there is going to be a one-time permanent upward adjustment in prices, and there's going to be a one-time permanent upward adjustment in costs. The question is, are those one-time upward adjustment in prices going to be validated by a one-time upward adjustment in wages? And my answer is no, primarily because the Federal Reserve is going to clamp, crush economic demand. And because they're going to do that, wages don't catch up to where prices have gone. And households will be less well off coming out of this than they were going into it, which means the economy will be that much weaker coming out of this. Stephen Rusciuto, you and I have seen OPEC, and then there was OPEC 2, and then there was 1986, where events take over. You are overcome by events. Can we see the same kind of shift here again where OPEC just says enough? I, I think you can. I mean, look, every boom in oil prices is followed by a bust in oil prices. Um, and it really is is a function of the market momentum. It's a function of, of the political environment. It's also a function of the... Um, uh, the efficiencies that right. get created in a system to deal with the higher prices. Mm. And this will eventually happen, whether it happens in 2022, 2023, or 2024, I'm not sure, but it will happen. I mean, at least I can't convey enough. Rusciuto, the Rusciuto family had a VW diesel. The Keene family had a VW diesel. Everybody set their thermostats at 45 degrees at night. And then, boom, OPEC blew it all up and the price collapsed. Wear a sweater, right? Steve, yeah, what I'll is the price point coat. for gasoline before we start to get some sort of sense of consumer crimping down on their spending? Well, I think you're already starting to see it. A number of the uh, company reports we're seeing in terms of Walmart and Target suggested it. You look inside the beige book yesterday. I mean, you know, the, the, the previous beige book said a few uh, retailers were starting to notice that consumers were pushing back on prices. Uh, this time through, half of the districts reported that consumers were pushing back on the pricing power and re reshuffling the mix of what they bought to deal with the pricing environment. So I think you're already starting to have the impact. It's it's just not there in the macro numbers. It shows up in the company level data before it shows up in the, in, the, in the monthly macro numbers. And go through the litany of tech companies, for example. We just had Hewlett Packard again last night downgrading its EPS. I mean, there are a lot of companies that have been doing this. And what surprises me the most is the bottom up street analysts haven't cut their earnings estimates yet. In fact, our earnings revision tracker, which measures increases versus decreases last month, was positive 0.2%, which meant nobody did anything. Thing. Nobody increased, nobody decreased. Everybody's just holding their numbers the same. And I think given the macro story, they're going to have to take their numbers down in a big way. Steve, such a good point to finish on, as always. Steve Fischuda there of Mizuho Securities. Capital Economics coming out with a note moments ago, Tom, just for Lisa. Here's the quote. The ADP report points to a dramatic slowdown in private payroll employment gains in May to 128,000. But given the survey's surprisingly poor real-time correlation there with the official non-farm payroll yes. data, we continue to forecast the latter will show a 300,000 when the report is released I, I, tomorrow. Can we just, you know, to Le in Lisa's defense, like, you know, can we just stop emphasizing it? I mean, the math, I believe Michael McKee would tell me the math doesn't work. Lisa? We talk about data dependency. Can we start stripping out certain data points and saying that they're irrelevant, and this Thank one you. being one of them, this is honestly? Valid. This Thank is you. Valid. Thank you for that edification. I feel safe. Do you want any more time? <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm good. No, I just, you know. Look, we can say it's, relatively speaking, less important than the numbers we get out tomorrow. Okay? I'm Thank going you. to be diplomatic for once, all right? This is what we're getting out of OPEC, and our team is reporting the following. That meeting has started, and they are looking at maybe increasing things by 600,000 barrels a day instead of the scheduled 430,000. This according to delegates, Tom. They might decide on July output and on August hikes as well today. Some of the latest from delegates speaking to our team, Tom. So that's the latest from OPEC as that meeting gets underway. Yeah, Brent 113 is now enjoying a 115, which is still... For 98.2% of Americans, that's not $80 a barrel. This no. is an adjustment. And Tom, even so, what did Francisco Blanche just say of Bank of America? At least it's so, so important to keep going over it. You've basically got an oil analyst turning around and saying, it doesn't matter what OPEC does, if they boost output by 400,000, well, 600,000. Right. Ultimately, this is about refining capacity. And through summer, gas prices, the price at the pump for the consumer, 
it's going to be problematic. It's going to be troublesome. Yeah, and you had another oil analyst, Christian Mela, coming out basically saying they're using the barrels that they have, but that just means there'll be all the less reserves for later because there isn't the investment. And that really is the main John. issue that's going to keep driving a tight, uh, tight oil market. Yes, Tweet of the day, John. Got to go with it. The Queen and the Duke of Kent. Oh, here we go. That works. <laughs> On radio, folks. Tom, um, I had to, have to admit, I had to double, take a double look. I look like I'm 86 years old. I had to take a second take. TK. You look good on the balcony. I do. That works. That works for me. I'm going to put the jacket back on, go over to the open and count you down to the open. Not because the open's more important, just because that studio is... A little it's, cooler. It's cooler than this one. <laughs> I'll catch up with Emily Rowland, Tony Dwyer and Chris Harvey as we count you down to the opening bell on Bloomberg TV. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. The price of oil is lower today. That's a, a report from the Financial Times that Saudi Arabia is ready to increase production if Russia has to cut back substantially due to international sanctions. Meanwhile, President Biden is likely to visit Saudi Arabia this month. He'll almost inevitably meet de facto ruler Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who he's shunned so far. That may pave the way for an oil production boost. In Ukraine, the central bank has more than doubled its benchmark interest rate in an attempt to stem inflation in the wake of the Russian invasion. Borrowing costs were raised from 10% to 25%. That is the highest in almost seven years. It was the first rate hike in four months. Inflation in Ukraine soared to 17% in May. The U.S. Supreme Court is facing a historic case backlog. The court is due to issue 33 opinions, 53% of its expected total in the final month of its current term. That is the most in percentage terms in more than 70 years. Among those are rulings that could effectively outlaw abortions in two dozen states and put more handguns on the street. And the man who shot and wounded President Reagan in 1981 will be unconditionally released June the 15th. John Hinckley has been living in Virginia under a number of restrictions since 2016. A judge says Hinckley is no longer a danger to himself or others. He shot the president and three others outside a Washington hotel. Global News 24 hours a day. On air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rich Gupta. This is Bloomberg. When there's optimism, when there's greed, when there's risk tolerance and so forth, uh, that's a very difficult climate for the value investor uh, to find uh, bargains. Now the prospective returns are on many asset classes are higher than they were just a little while ago. And uh, again, a much better climate for the bargain hunter. Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital, a really piercing interview with Lisa uh, yesterday. Lisa Bramowitz, what really dazzled me there is when he talked about the hurdle rate for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he helps run the money. And he said, look, it was 5%, and maybe in the new regime they can take out 7% a year. Yeah. Are we all going to be saying that? Or more than 7%, because if you just take a look at high-yield bonds uh, yields, the average yield is about 7% or even right. higher, which is a stark change. Does it matter? I guess that the bigger question question is, does it matter if you can get more yield in an environment where inflation is that much higher and the real takeaway is still basically the same, Tom? Howard Marks here of Oak Tree. Right now we're going to move on to an incredibly important essay. It is by no surprise Barry Ritholtz, host of Masters of Business, chairman of Ritholtz Wealth Management, and we're thrilled he could pull away from his watching of the Jubilee coverage in London uh, today. Barry, I thought your note was spectacular about recessions state by state. You have the courage to go granular and do a lot more analysis than the cheap punditry. Does Mississippi have a recession or does Montana have a recession? No, not only do they not have a recession, but they're expanding by the most they've expanded in, in quite a while. In fact, if you look at the Philadelphia Federal Reserve index of state coincidence, um, state coincident indicators uh, across all 50 states, every state in the union is expanding. We have all 50 states who not only are not in a recession, but are seeing their economies grow. And when you look at the history of recessions, you know, going back 30, 40 years, 
long before a recession starts, you start to see that number go from 50 states to 45, 40, 35 states. <clears throat> you just don't have a recession start with all 50 states in, right. in expansion, including 2020's pandemic. The, the economies had slown in a number of locations before that recession began. Right. Barry, what is the history of the pundits getting wrong how corporations adapt given inflation? The collective memory of our listeners and viewers on inflation is maybe 5% understand what a real inflation is. And the fact is corporations adapt. That, that's right. This this is a classic example of George Soros's uh, idea of leaf, reflexivity, meaning when something happens that's a challenge uh, either to corporate America or the markets or the economy, events subsequently adapt to that. Management changes, the Fed does different things, the federal government will respond. And this is part of the reason why projecting out, forget even two years, six months or, or, or 12 months is so challenging because it's all but impossible to tell what's going to happen during the intervening um, weeks and months that are going to change the trajectory of the economy or change the trajectory of the stock market. It, it's impossible to tell um, from a standing point, call it the three-body problem in astrophysics. There are just too many variables to figure out what things are going to look like that far down the road. Given that, Barry, and given the fact that corporate executives themselves have basically come out and changed their projections or withdrawn forecasts, if you take a look at S&P Global yesterday, because they just don't have a clear read on things, how well can companies really adapt? Or is this a new environment of disadaptation, right, because there just is this big unknown? So I, I love the irony of the company in charge of guessing what future um, credit and um, earnings was going to look like has has no forward um, recognition. The, the reality is they never do, but we're normally more comfortable pretending. That That's the whole mm -hmm. um, trope about uncertainty. The future is always inherently uncertain. We just can lie to ourselves pretty effectively most of the time. So we see two things going on with corporate America. The lack of visibility, like there ever is a whole lot of visibility, um, is one thing, but I've also noticed a pretty substantial uptick in insiders buying their own stock. And that's always a welcome sign. It doesn't mean we're at a bottom. We probably have some more work to do, but who, who right. really knows? But when you see insiders stop selling and start buying, it tends to suggest that the world isn't coming to an end. Now, Barry, i got to leave it there. Barry, I'll thank you so much, particularly on state-by-state -state analysis of recession. Lisa Jobs tomorrow. I can't believe the survey's still there, 3.5% unemployment rate. It's going to keep going down. That is the expectation. There still are a lot of job openings, and there's still a lot of companies looking to hire. You know, Peter Buchvar over at Bleakley Advisory yeah, love him. came out with an explanation of how ADP can be useful. Uh, he dug into particularly small businesses and talked about the second month in a row of declines in terms of jobs added. And the way that he interpreted this was these companies are having a tough time competing with newly elevated wage bars set by its bigger competitors. <clears throat> how much is that going to become a theme? right? The Amazons, the Walmarts really setting the bar with minimum wage, smaller businesses having a harder time managing that kind of wage increase. I strongly agree with that. I, I just, I, you know, I, I get the idea here, $22 an hour, whatever the wage war is among these ginormous companies. But Lisa, what does small business do a mile or 10 miles away from that Amazon warehouse? There is a question of how much we get a redistribution mm -hmm. of, uh, of market share, even more to the bigger companies. Right. Also, how much are companies going to say, look, we cannot hire people at these higher costs. It's, We're going to have to figure out a way to make do. And at what point does that right. slow the labor progress. Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keenan, we'll continue our coverage tomorrow, Jobs Day, exceptionally important, and also we'll dip into the service at St. Paul's Cathedral for the Queen's Jubilee. How are you going to prepare for that? Are you going to practice more waving I'm gonna, tonight? I'm going to read my Christopher Wren architecture. That's what I do. Do you have I a hat? Read. 
You should wear no, a hat. I should wear a you hat. should wear a yeah. hat. I think that it would be fabulous. Tomorrow's jobs report, I think, is actually one of the key reports uh, nice that we're you. going to be getting. Thanks. That was just really ungraceful. It was just a complete yeah. uh, just shift. Sure. But I am looking at those jobs mm. numbers for some sense right. of what the Fed can cling to for that patience that so many people think can happen if they oh. get to neutral and then stop. This is an interesting market. Stay tuned. We'll continue on radio and television. Thomas Petrie, truly one of the most knowledgeable on American oil in the 12 noon hour. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.